Um, thank you all very much for joining us. This is a joint meeting of the Region 1 and Region 3 SAC. And um, we wanted to bring you two together because we have some speakers tonight who are going to give kind of a joint presentation that's relevant to all parts of the, the North County um, area. So we thought it would make sense to bring you two to put the two groups together to do this. Um, the very first thing that we need to do tonight, though, is a very quick piece of housekeeping. Um, Region 1 typically does this, approves the agenda for the evening. Region 3, it's something that we're going to need to start to do as well. So um, let me point to the Region 1 chair, and if you would call a vote on approving the agenda. Good evening, everyone. My name is Karen Tiravani. I'm Region 1 Chair. Um, if I can get Region 1, I'd like to make uh, a motion to approve uh, the GMA's agenda. Second. I need to vote that first. Okay. <laughs> 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 Doing it, but <laughs> and second, please. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. And Jason, would you help? Yeah, oh, I'm oh, sorry. I apologize. Um, if anyone opposed, all in favor? Uh, so it's moving so quickly. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And Jason, would you mind doing the same for Region Three? Yes, Jason Mulgrew, Region Three. Um, so if we can have a motion, a motion to approve the agenda for the meeting for someone from Region Three. Motion. Second. It's been motioned, properly seconded. <laughs> uh, all those that approve. Aye. Uh, uh, the the nines have the, the nays have the same right. Very nice. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Um, and that, that's it for the housekeeping. Now I will turn it over to our speakers. Um, if you would like to come up and um, and introduce yourselves. And uh, Karen, I believe that your uh, presentation first. is first, correct? Yep. Is that correct? Okay. All right. Where would you like to just standing up here. Which Are you going to take care of it? Yeah. Just give me a second. Okay. Let's see if I can actually see this. Well, thanks for having me, everybody. My name is Karen McJunkin. I am a developer. I'm a regional partner with Home Street Development. I have been developing in the county for 35 years. I know you're saying I started when you were 16. McJunkin. I have no idea how to spell it. Sure. MC. I got that from you. J U N. Okay. K I N. Oh, I almost did that. But I, thought it was like, okay. I have been asked to present tonight on market rate housing. I think you guys may have had an affordable housing presentation a bit ago. So this is coming from the market rate housing perspective, and I'm going to come at it from both the supply side and the demand side. Um, I think it's important to note I'm not here to advocate any certain position. It's really just to give the data and sort of what we see in terms of trends from a supply and demand side in the Anne Arundel County market. You want to move to the next. Um, starting with supply, um, our supply is primarily dominated by production builders in this county. Um, they are the lowest cost producers, the most efficient producers, and and I'll get to the to to why that matters in just a second. But but so what we end up with, um, great housing, great product um, housing stock, but it has tended to look the same over the years. It's the same basic townhouse. You can go to the next uh, next slide. Um, same basic townhome, twenty by forty or sixteen by forty. Same basic rectangle for both townhouses and single family. Um, the majority of the new for sale construction is, has been townhouses in recent years, you know, in the, before 2010, in the early 2000s, it was predominantly single family detached. It has moved over time to be predominantly townhouses with fewer and fewer single family detached being produced and even fewer condominiums being produced. Um, you know, why is that I hit on this? They're very, very efficient to build this, the same type of unit. Um, and why, why does that matter? In this particular area, we have very high land costs relative to the overall cost of the home. And you, uh, you'll see a breakdown of costs in a minute. So when you have a high land cost, it, it makes a builder, and these are for-profit builders, build the most efficient unit they possibly can. 
And that's what we have here. Now, I will say, you can go to the next slide. Um, you know, we, we've had some changes in the skin of the townhouses or single family detached, a little more modern look, um, you know, not, not just colonial like we used to see um, in the early 2000s. So it's changed a bit. But what we haven't gotten a whole lot of is, is a lot of what you've been hearing lately, and that's the missing middle. We want to hit the next slide. Um, you know, the, the cottage, the, the, the duplex down here, you know, some more of the cottage look in the upper right, or even some a sixplex that you see here. We haven't gotten a lot of that. And a, and a lot of that has to do with, again, we're dominated by production builders in this market. And also because our, in its current state, our zoning and sub, subdivision regulations don't make it economically feasible to build these. And let me give you an example. In um, R5 zone, which is five units to the acre, um, the um, minimum lot width is 50 feet. And so if you've got a production builder that's paying a high price for that lot, they're going to maximize what they can put on that lot. And so a 20 foot wide cottage does not maximize the production of that lot. Um, so now I will say that um, this, I think there's been some effort recently on the part of staff and the council to start looking into missing middle housing and hopefully that will result in some different product types. But right now we don't have a whole lot of this. Let me go to the next slide. Um, housing supply characteristics, not just what's being built, but, but what's it costing? Um, between, well, in the early part of the pandemic, the supply chain collapsed and prices increased or costs increased between 30 and 40%. Mm -hmm. We've seen that flatten out a bit in, um, in townhouses and single family construction. I will say in multifamily, costs have continued to escalate um, and, and there's really no end in sight right now. Um, the average new home price over the last five years is up 40 plus percent, just depending on which part of the county, but overall it's up about 40%. Um, another interesting statistic is um, the number of new home communities is down by 80% over the last four years. Um, a couple of reasons, or probably more than that, but I'll give you a couple of reasons. During the pandemic, um, despite what we thought, and I think everybody else thought, um, sales went out of control. And so the existing inventory in a lot of these communities was sold quicker than anybody ever imagined. And that, you know, piled on top of that was the fact that um, school APF uh, prevented a lot of new communities coming through the pipeline at that time. Now that has since changed with legislation that was passed last January. Um, but the, the pipeline wasn't being re refilled as quickly as houses were being sold. Um, will that reverse itself? You know, remains to be seen. Uh, not a lot of buildable ground left. Depends on what happens re with redevelopment as well. Um, and I'll let's go to the next slide, and I'll, I'll just um, walk you through this to, to give you a sense of sort of where we are in terms of supply. Um, over on the far left, total building permits in 1990, the green is multifamily, the blue is single family. And that includes both townhouses and single family detached. And it just goes year by year up to 2023. We are um, in 2023 at 1,073 permits, and that's pretty much in line with the Great Recession of 2008. The, the trend is, is moving down. There's not a whole lot in the pipeline right now. Um, again, it may reverse itself in the future depending on rezonings and, and uh, redevelopment. Um, but right now um, we're seeing a decline in permits. Next slide. Um, thought it might be helpful to um, just show what goes into the cost of a town. Um, and so starting up at the top, um, the top row lot costs, again, it's 2019, 2022, and 2024, just to give you a sense of how prices have changed over time, or costs have changed over time. Second row down, permit fees, 
including impact and connection fees. Um, the cost of actually constructing the unit is the third line. Builder soft costs, the fourth line, and then the builder profit, which has remained relatively um, constant in terms of a percent. Um, so the fourth column percent change, that's 2024 um, over 2019. Um, and we've seen law costs go up 48% over that time period. Um, permit fees up 37%. Construction costs, like I mentioned before, up a little over 40%. Builder soft costs, because it's typically a percent of everything else, up 40, a little over 40%. And then um, profit up 50%, again, because it's typically a percent. Um, and then sales prices at the bottom. The 16 by 40 townhouse, and I should have said that from the beginning, that's what these costs are a part of. I would call that starter home, a 16 by 40 townhouse. Um, and those prices back in 2019, the average was right around 354,000 and we're, um, we're up to five, 508,000. Um, the, um, another, I, you know, I added the last column, um, the last two columns to give you an idea and, and sort of bring home the point of how much higher land costs are in this market versus the national average. The top line is probably the one to key in on. Um, and that is um, our land costs run about 30 to 31% of the total cost of the house um, or the total price. And um, national average is about 17%. Um, another one, you know, the permit fees are double the national average here. Um, you know, total dollars, it's not as significant as the lot costs, but, but from a, you know, it's double what the national average is. Am I taking questions as we go? Or, okay. at at, feel free to ask questions. Yeah, um, sure. <clears throat> in the previous slide, I yeah, wouldn't go back. No, I, well, it's just the term multifamily. Does that refer to the townhomes? No, multifamily would be apartments. Apartments. Or condominiums. And single family is either townhome or duplex. In the previous slide, that's how the county okay. tracks it. I wasn't sure what the multifamily meant. Yes. Is okay. there a specific threshold for what's considered multifamily or the five, the 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 one that you showed that had like five? You know, it's a shared entrance is what. So so that would be a multifamily. Okay. Yeah. Yes. How are you providing for the green space um, deficit or the requirements that are uh, required by the county environment department. Is it the open space that you're utilizing to account for the green space necessary? That's when you cut down a tree, you have to allow the space. Well, there are lots of environmental regulations and, and um, requirements. We have an open space requirement. We have a forest conservation requirement. We have a recreation area requirement. So all those end up as under an umbrella of open areas, if you will. Okay. And so um, I always thought when I was younger that townhomes were a lot more economical and less expensive than homes, but they're approaching the price of homes that I'm aware of. Well, new, we new construct, I'm talking new construction, yeah. not, not resale. So, so new single family detached, which obviously is not up here, um, is, is solidly, even for the, the affordable, in the sixes and high sixes and up in Hanover County. You can't, yeah. <laughs> Seven, right? Putting in high school problems. Yeah. Or eight. Yeah. Well, what factors contribute to the higher land costs? Um, it's supply demand. Is what? Supply demand. Okay. But what does that mean though? Because we're talking land. I mean, what supplies are impacting the cost of the land. Well, and we, the you know, there's a, part, part of it. there's a base demand for housing and there are builders in the market to supply that housing. They know what the demand is. They know they can sell a house. And so they're in competition to buy that lot to provide that house. When you've got competition chasing a limited supply, it's driving the price up. Especially yeah. the permits being as low as they are right now. 
That certainly doesn't help our system because the, the inventory is so much lower. I mean, right. Obviously, what exists is there, but okay, the so bill is so low. Are we running out of are you running out of space? Yeah. 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 I, I mean, the, the other okay. thing is what a lot of times what has happened in the past. Mm -hmm. Let's say again, I'm thinking a brown figure. Let's say there's a hundred acre farm or something. You know, you and I could, you know, and the, the person selling it wants to sell it for a million dollars. Well, we couldn't afford that. But some, but a developer who may cut, who may say, I'm not ready to build there today, but I can see in five, 10, 15 years, we'll be able to, cut, we'll be ready to develop, develop that. So we'll just buy it and put it on the shelf. Yeah. And that happens a lot. Yeah. Makes sense. This is, yeah. I don't know if this is even a thing. It, it's interesting that chart that shows from 1990 up to current. Be interested to see is there a way to track the amount of available space for purchase, right? Um, available ground. That could yeah, be, like because in 1990, the landscape plan in Ronald County probably looked a lot different than it does today. Um, and so it'd be interesting to see if there's a way to track the amount of available lots or acreage for development versus their, what, what's available today. That's a constant analysis that yeah. we, we certainly try and do. I mean, it's, um, and I, I and I think it's called carrying capacity, basically. Yeah. And and I think the the planning staff has that as well. We may disagree on what the end <laughs> result of that is, but um, but it is being done, and it's important, you know, an important component of the entire analysis right. of you know this is what you guys are here to try and decide. And there are lots of competing policies that you need to sort of sort through and figure out. And so builder soft cost, what is that? You know, that's selling fees, marketing, oh. overhead, oh. paying salaries for the superintendents. You know, it's, it's <laughs> all that. Paying salary to the superintendent? That's out there on the site. Oh, monitoring. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not the school <laughs> superintendent. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, that is the <laughs> And that, we'll go to the next slide. This um, takes a look at affordability, supply affordability, and how it's changed over time and sort of the factors that have gone into it. So it's taking the numbers from the slide before, which are the sales prices. And then taking mortgage rates at 19, 22, and 24, which, you know, 3.8, 5.5, and 7.9, and then working down through um, to get to an affordability index, if you will. And so that this bottom line number here is um, the percent of the median household income in that year that you would have to earn to afford that townhouse that I just listed on the previous slide. So in 2019, um, we had low mortgage rates going for us. And so you're close to, you could earn close to 80% of the median household income and afford that starter home. And that's kind of where the sweet spot is for, you know, workforce affordable housing. So we were there and then we slowly really gotten away from it. In 2022, mortgage rates up a bit, prices up. Okay. Um, you had to earn over 100% of the median household income to afford that single unit. Know. And then you get to 2024, and we know where rates, you know, where rates are now, and prices continue to go up, and you're at 100 and earning 133% of the median household income to afford that, that unit. Um, so um, I'll touch briefly on the demand side of things. Um, you know, demographic trends that we've seen in the county and, and you know, they ebb and flow over time. This is sort of the constant over the last few years. Um, household size is decreasing. Um, you know, what does that mean? It, you know, it, it means that there's there's an increased demand for individual units, but you probably don't need them quite as big. Uh, fewer children. Um, we'll see how that plays out in school enrollment, but we're certainly seeing fewer children in our communities these days. Um, lots of ethnic diversity is very cool to see in our in our uh, new home communities. Um, and then there is that age restricted buyer out there still in Anne Arundel County. This is a very, very um, nice place to live for retirees. And, and we see a big demand for that. Um, 
what are folks looking for in communities? Um, and again, this will come into play when you're having discussions on where should growth occur, what makes the most sense. You know, uh, most folks, especially the younger folks these days, love walkability. They love living near something, shopping, mm -hmm. schools, recreational amenities, those sorts of things. Um, lots of outdoor amenity focused um, buyers. Um, Lots of folks, and this kind of goes to, um, you know, there is still demand for single family detached, but a lot of folks are looking for the low maintenance living. I don't know if there are folks never taught them how to mow a lawn, but, but anyhow, um, a lot of, you know, we sell a lot of townhomes um, that have complete maintenance in the front yard, even people just don't even want to touch it. And a lot of that's because you work hard, right? And you drive home, it's a 45 minute drive home, and the last thing you want to do is that. So, seeing a lot of that. Um, and a lot of interest in different product that we just can't um, deliver on an economical basis. And that goes back to that missing middle. Um, and again, still strong um, demand for single family to cash. Um, demand drivers in this area, I think we all know what they are. Um, it's, it's, you know, the, the, uh, the gold mile there, um, Fort Meade, NSA, it's employment growth. That's what drives demand in this area. Primarily, secondarily, it's a wonderful place to live. And we certainly did see um, folks fleeing from DC during COVID that wanted to be out, out here. And that had some, something to do with uh, the sales that we saw during COVID. Um, what did COVID have to do with people wanting to leave DC? Everything was shut down. You wanted to get away from people. And uh, so it's less densely common. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so next slide, and I'll end on this one. Um, I actually have one more slide. Um, so when I, when I've done this, um, this talk to other groups, I, I, I think I've, I've landed on what I think the key question is for, for the SACs. And that is, you know, is it possible to increase the housing supply if that's what you think is necessary in a way that's environmentally sensitive, like you were talking about? and compatible with existing neighborhoods and provides what buyers are looking for. Like I said before, so many competing policies in that, and it's, it's a tough one to reconcile all those. Um, where do I see some of the opportunities if there is a desire to, um, next slide please, um, you know, to, to increase the supply, um, you know, it's focusing on the town centers, higher density in town centers. Um, update the zoning and subdivision regulations. So maybe you could allow the cottages um, or, or other missing middle type housing. Um, and then um, updating zoning and subdivision regulations. So right now, as a developer, if something is zoned R5 or R10, that typically means 10 times the number of acres, let's say 50, 50 or 10 acres for an R5. We should get 50 units on it. We typically achieve about 60% of that. So there might be an opportunity to change the subdivision regulations without having too much of an environmental impact to achieve a greater percentage of the allowable density. Might be an opportunity. Anyhow, I'll just leave you with those, not advocating for anything, just some ideas to toss out there. Yeah. What does three-dimensional design aesthetics mean? Um, you know, it, it's instead of being prescriptive on you know, your setbacks or this, you have to build this envelope. It's more looking at design mm -hmm. and being more open mm -hmm. to, to out-of-the-box design. Another tough one. I mean, where do you... And it's hard on the planners. Where do you stop? You know, can you trust that developer to do the right thing if it's not prescriptive? <clears throat> Any other questions? What kind of places do have that middle housing that wants to get? You know, you can you can find it quite a bit in the southeast in Sunbelt. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They have different zoning requirements. Then. Correct. Yeah, that's your yes. question. So um just kind of go back a little bit. Let's just take the farming, the farming property that um, developers are buying up and just holding on to. Uh, are you finding that there is pushback because more than likely there's an agricultural easement 
a perpetual easement in place? Are you finding a challenge with the county extinguishing these easements? Um, you know, I, to build on. I, it's not really an easement for like I, I we would never just because well, renovation. You know, that's just no, no. I, I'm going to go back to to I, as a developer, we would not buy a a farm and just sit on it. You know, we we're a profit making venture, so we're gonna hmm. well just using that. Yeah, but but you know, um, okay. maybe your question is. Do we run into roadblocks? Is that that, that would be one. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> is the county lenient with? Okay, yeah, we have or the state, whatever. You know, I, 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 you know, easements are easements. You can't extinguish it. I no, the county isn't lenient, nor should they be. Well, that being said, you, you, you know, there are ways to change to change the regulations yeah. for zoning if you, if that's what you want to do. You you can request to extinguish an easement. Don't mean it's going to be granted. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other part I had, um, I can't, okay, I didn't write it down. Sorry, thank you. You mentioned that the size of that one lot said it was, um, the, the example you gave of, a 50 foot wide lot. Yes. Mm -hmm. What would be a change that could um, promote higher denser growth or, or promote the objectives that you're outlining here? Well, let's say again, I'm going to stick with that R5 because I use that to say we typically uh, achieve 60% or 30 units, right? So let's say instead of a 50 foot wide lot, you allow a 30 foot wide lot with five foot side yards. And then you've got a 20 foot wide cottage. And you you basically increased your achievable density because you're you're you know you're doing two for every fifty foot lot plus ten feet. Yeah. Making your houses more likely to see in Baltimore and they're skinny and narrow. Yeah, yeah. Or or you know, someone could choose to do a 36 foot wide and do a little bit wider yeah. or deeper. Yeah. That um <laughs> 60% of allowable density, what type of uh, regulations are, are you running into that prevent you from increasing that number? Is it like environmental issues or is it like walkways need to be there? You know, like, you know, it, it, sometimes it's parking requirements. Sometimes it's, um, it's rec area requirements, recreational area. Um, you know, that Part of the code in particular is a vestige of a long time ago when um, it was desired to just have this big open area. What's what's much more market accepted now and, and no amenities. And so it was just it's a it's a, a formula in the middle of the neighborhood. So many square feet per house you have had to provide. What's more market accepted now is a smaller area, but you've got a pickleball court, you've got a dog park, and you know, all the other stuff, pool, clubhouse. Um, so if you reduce that area requirement, but instead, you know, you, you, you have all the other amenities, then you can increase your buildable area. And there are, you know, a few other examples of things like that. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric DeVito. I am the Vice President and General Counsel at Greenberg Gibbons. You're probably familiar with some of our projects, Annapolis Town Center, the Wall Chapels, Edgewater Village Center. We also have projects throughout Maryland, and now we even have projects in other states. So I was tasked tonight to sort of give you a feel for retail development in Anne Arundel County, sort of how it's progressed and to sort of explain some of the challenges to developing new retail and to just sort of answer some of the burning questions that I always get, you know, why can't I have a Trader Joe's in my neighborhood? Um, <laughs> why can't I have nice, you know, village center retail near my neighborhood and all that? So I'll get into some of that tonight through the presentation and sort of explain to you what retailers, sort of how retailers look at things and why there isn't a trade, Trader Joe's on more corners in Anne Arundel County. So, and I, I welcome questions along the way. 
Um, there'll be some information presented here on numbers and costs and things, and also just sort of general, sort of how retail gets developed. So I kind of went into some of this. That's who we are. We develop all sorts of retail. We develop from the high density, vertically integrated mixed use to what I would call all the way down to what I would call curbside retail. And curbside retail would be sort of a, either a pad site, which just has like a you know, typical fast food restaurant just sitting there on one pad. So what we call a multi-tenant building, which it maybe has three or four tenants in it all in one building, but the parking is right there by the retail. People pull up, they go in, they do some quick service, they get back in their car and they go. That's what we would consider the curb size. And honestly, village center type retail is more of that curb style, curb, curbside style of retail. So these are just some of the examples of some of our our projects, including some neighborhood shopping centers, Turf Valley in Howard County. I don't know if you've ever been there. We did all of that. Um, and Edgewater, again, is another example of what I would call uh, neighborhood retail. It's a grocery anchor, small retail shopping center. So what are some trends in the retail industry? So the Amazon effect, which we're all well aware of. There was a belief that Amazon would just flat out kill retail. That has not happened. In fact, just the opposite. Physical, a lot of retailers believe that having a physical presence is key to the retail. Even if they have really strong online sales, they felt that even that showroom, sort of having a brick and mortar presence helps more sales. So brick and mortar is still alive. What's happened though on the Amazon effect though, that first line is your typical anchors are pretty much your Macy's, your Lord and Taylor, your Sears, your JC Penney's, pretty much that. And Macy's just announced closing another, you know, 150 stores. JC Penney's not long for this world. So I mean, those anchors are gone. What's happened is in retail, is grocery stores are now what is considered the anchors, because grocery stores bring in tons and tons of foot traffic. You know, I mean, you you may go to Dick Sporting Goods once a month. You go to your grocery store probably two or three times a week. I don't know if you're like me. I'm there all the time. And so that's why retailers want to be near grocery stores because that's all that foot traffic that increases um, their own shoppers. So grocery is the new anchor. Off price are really doing well. Your TJX brands, TJ, TJX brands are Marshalls, Home Goods, um, Home Sense, um, TJ Maxx, of course, and then Ross and others alike of that ilk are all doing really well. Um, and again, that's because. Amazon can't really compete that well with the off price. I mean, they're, those off price can hold their own against Amazon. That's why they're still here. This is an interesting stat, which shows that retail is relatively healthy. 45% more openings last year than closings. So that's a good trend for retail. However, 65% lower new retail construction since 2008 through 2022, and I'm sure 2023 is the same. I'll show you some reasons why construction of new retail is still on the decline. Um, rent growth is one of the reasons. I have some slides we'll talk about that. Retail rents, when, I'm, when I say retail rents, meaning rents that a tenant can pay to rent space, to lease space, that's still relatively stagnant. In order for new retail development to occur, those retail rents need to climb a bit. And then there's always this threat of recession, but again, COVID was so bad to the retail industry, it probably couldn't be anywhere else. Probably the single worst thing that's ever happened to the retail industry. And if it weathered that, it pretty much came. So this is just some examples. We the retail trend, you see like a lot of grocery stores on there, you see a lot of those off price. These are all tenants that we've entered into leases before in our various shopping centers. So we've done deals with all of these types of tenants. These are all what we would consider national good credit tenants that if you're building a shopping center, you want a lot of these in your center. So you fill it up with some good, high credit um, national retailers, and then you backfill it with some local places, right? You can't fill the whole center. You don't really want to fill the whole center with them, but you do need a couple of them to keep your center healthy, and then you backfill with some local. So what is the essential and experiential? I'm curious about that. So essential. So personal services are starting to make their way into a lot of shopping centers. You'll see like what you've never seen in the past, physical therapists. 
right? A physical therapist would be in a typical sort of suburban office building. Now you see them in retail. There now is a retail presence for uh, massage, physical therapy, dentist offices are now in a lot of retail shopping centers. So that's sort of this essential need-based services. Magnesium, tutoring services. These are all types of things in the past you wouldn't have considered those to be retail. They are retail now. And in fact, it's so bad, and we're going to talk about this at the end, a lot of retailers have restrictions and exclusions. So if you get a big, one of these retailers that you really want, like Whole Foods, well, they have a bunch of exclusions in their lease. They say, well, I don't want to be next to a restaurant, and I don't want to be next to a, a kid's tutoring, and I don't want to be next to a dance studio. And I don't so when you see retail evolving to where some of these essential services want to be next to these grocery stores, well, you have to go get waivers. You have to go get permission. Parking is one big thing. So they don't want someone coming and parking in front of their store and staying there for three hours to go sit in a restaurant because it's eating up parking for their customers. That's a big issue. And they also like a certain clientele that comes to the shop. So they want people who are going to spend money at Whole Foods. That's they want those types of friends in the shop. So when they have ideas, I'm not saying I agree with all of them, but they all have ideas in their head as a type of customer. Base. So they like to preclude certain things. And the experiential is like the fitness places? Experiential would be fitness, would be any sort of entertainment type use too. I mean, um, those are, uh, but definitely um, fitness and there's things like, there's something called Puck Shack now where it's sort of an indoor uh, pump up golf course. Those are becoming sort of more popular. You might start seeing around here. That's what I would call experiential. Ax throwing places. One of the other reasons why, you know, when you're the big chains, like you like to mention the Macy's, the Asian Penning, I think a lot of that kind of has, um, I, I, I want to say the fashion trends have changed a bit. Uh, I'll, I'll pick one, Jason, because you're sitting right next to me. But did you come from work? They did. This is this is what we were. Do you have to wear a tie? I don't. When was, when was the last time you wore a tie at work? Exactly. <laughs> and, and the thing is, it's and and the, the, the ladies have more cat. Basically, I think the country's gone to see like in the workplace, the the cat more of a casual. Um, okay. dress code. No question. But men's warehouse is still there. Yeah, it's still doing okay. You go to Nordstrom Rack, they still have a suit and tie section and ties. It's all still there. It's just the experience is different, right? You're not going to shopping or department stores anymore. And, you know, I've got a daughter, a 21 year old daughter, and, you know, she buys a lot of dresses. She buys a lot of them on her own. Yeah. You know, she's yeah. not going to the mall anymore, as much. If she does, she's going to free people or places like that. She's definitely not going to Macy's. So that's, that's where she's buying. I have a question, um, Karen Kanani, um, as far as to when some of these places, such as Whole Foods, um, have clauses about who can be their neighbors and things. Um, who is now at the responsibility to find those tenants or reject? Like, is that something that's put out to the community prior, or um, is it just like if another tenant wants to come in next door, they find out when they apply? Or who who's now is it on to build? It's on the owner of the shopping center, the landlord. The landlord enters into a lease with Whole Foods. Okay. In the lease, it will have these exclusives and restrictions spelled out in the lease. Okay. And it's on the landlord's obligation to not lease any other spaces that violate that lease. And in fact, when you sign, the next person who comes in line signs a lease, it references the Whole Foods exclusives in that new tenancy. So they know they've signed a lease and they've agreed not to do these things that I can't do. Right yeah, no, that's okay. That's something a lot of people don't realize. Right, I feel like that needed to be spoken on. I feel like that's something it, that it's awful, to and and we've done it to ourselves as landlords, and I hate it, and I wish we never would agree to one restriction and exclusive. It's just terrible. But sometimes to get one of these tenants at your shopping center, you have to do this. And you know we're our own worst enemies. It makes a little more sense now. So yeah, for the public, you know, and people who don't know to hear that. that yeah, you know. exactly. Sure. So challenges to building new retail. I'll run through each of these on other slides. Demographics. Every retailer, at least your you know bigger retailers like your Trader Joe's, your Whole Foods. The first thing to look at is demographics, population, population density, income level. 
education is a really big thing. A lot of the retailers like Trader Joe's like to see a, a highly educated population. Mm -hmm. The higher the education, the more they spend money in their store. At least a lot of them have done these studies. Um, that's density rooftops, daytime population. So maybe there aren't a lot of rooftops, but there are a ton of people who work in the area during the day. Like, I, you know, we were just talking about Whole Foods. Whole Foods loves it when there's a lot of people working in the day because they go to the salad bar for lunch. They pick up some groceries on before they head home. So they look for daytime populations too. Traffic. Everyone thinks, oh, traffic's terrible. Yeah, the retailer really likes traffic. A lot of cars. They love traffic jams. They're like hundreds of thousands of cars sitting on their road. <laughs> They love it and they look for it. Cost prohibitive, we'll talk about that. And then the restrictions and exclusions we just mentioned. So demographics, here's some examples for, so these were actually taken straight out of shopping center brochures that we were actually looking to purchase, um, some of these shopping centers. So they promote their demographics. So this was a shopping center in Harford County. They talked, there's the population, that's growth. Average household income, home value, daytime employees. Remember, I mentioned that. This is Howard County over here. So, incomes, um, education levels, it's all sort of spelled out. So, that's the first thing that a, a shopping center owner and a retailer, they look at these numbers to see how it compares. Sorry, so yeah. far, I don't know if it's just me. It was very small. I really can't see. Is there any way to enlarge that? The top at the bottom? I just really can't see. At the bottom? Yeah, yeah I, if not, no worries. Yeah, I mean, I can read them some of them to you. I mean, yeah, it's a, the average household income in Howard County is 188,000 compared to sort of the USA as an average of 105. So that shows you sort of the disparity back here. Bachelor's degree or higher, Howard County 65 percent, USA 35 percent. So a retailer really likes Howard County. Howard, Howard, this is Howard. That's how that's hard. Okay. This is Howard. So Anne Arundel is probably between Hartford and Howard on these demographics. So and again, I'm just using this as an example of what a retailer would look like. So they look at Howard County and they say, all right, this is this is where I want to be. Trader Joe's. Here's an example of Trader Joe's that um, a lot of people say, why can't I have Trader Joe's? Trader Joe's number one thing is they look for population density education, incomes, all that. Here's an example. There is one Trader Joe's in Anaheim. Mm -hmm. One, yeah. in an yeah. Yeah. There's, there's one in Columbia, Howard County. Mm -hmm. There are two in Baltimore, Not none in the city. There's one in Towson, we built it actually, that's our Trader Joe's. And there's one in Pikesville. And then that's the DC area. Right? And I'm gonna show you why in a second. So this is the, some demographics on District of Columbia. Look at that green box. 4,000 population per square kilometer, 4,000. So the total population of D.C. is only 670,000. It's very close to Anne Look at the density. Now look at Baltimore, next one. Similar population, drops down to 2,700, right? Now look at Anne Arundel, okay. 500. So the population of DC is over is roughly eight times the population density as Anne Arundel County. That's why there are probably eight times as many Trader Joe's in DC as there are in Anne Arundel County. So to get another, unfortunately, to get another Trader Joe's in Anne Arundel County somewhere, you're just going to need more population growth. And honestly, it's not growing very much. I mean, and Anne Arundel is actually one of the higher growing jurisdictions in the state. And it's still not growing very much. So you're probably stuck with one Trader Joe's for quite some time. So. <laughs> Densification, some examples of it. Towson Road, I don't know if any of you've been to Towson. This is a relatively new development. We built this. This is what I would call true urban densification, vertically integrated, Whole Foods and other retail on the first floor, residential above. That's retail residential. That's a hotel, dual flag hotel. That's a lot of density on five acres, right? So that's a way to create density in a relatively urban setting. That's one example. Next one, this is our Hunt Valley Town Center. If you've ever been to Hunt Valley, Maryland, way north of the city. This was, we rebuilt them all um, in the uh, early 2000s. It used to be an old, 
typical mall. It looked like Marley Station, honestly. It was on deadmalls.com. It was a dead, dead mall. <laughs> Built it, tore it all down, rebuilt it. This is sort of a main street. This existing retail, that's Wegmans. Yeah. This paint, that was an old Sears, like an old Sears and old Sears Auto Center. It's all been repurposed. This has been repurposed into fitness, furniture stores, some quick serve restaurants. And then back in the back, this is what I wanted to show you, next to the theater, that's a Regal. Next to that theater was a parking lot. Just a flat parking lot, looked just like this. On the left is now an Avalon apartment building. Right next to it is a Brightview Senior Living Assisted Living facility. This is structured, park, both structured parking, straight up on three acres. So you're densifying an existing shopping center. So you're going and taking a parking lot, you're getting density, by basically turning existing impervious area into housing units, you know, assisted living and regular apartment. That's a way to densify a suburban shopping center. Annapolis Mall is an opportunity to do something like this. You know, there are other opportunities to do something like this. Not everywhere. Again, it's, you know, there's probably, there's 800,000 square feet of retail at this shopping center. So it was a good prime opportunity to do that sort of thing. You can't do it. So region three, for those of you in region three, you know what that is. <laughs> that just needs completely torn down. I don't know if there's really any way to fix that, but, but many have tried and many will probably. Why is that? Well, I just want to add. Let's start. Let's start. So stay tuned, I guess. Yeah. But if you go back to that one, the other one I wanted to hide that star right there. This is actually a county property at 7409 WBNA Boulevard, which is actually going through a redevelopment proposal right now. That's interesting. A lot of people think it could be sort of that vertically integrated mixed use sort of thing that you see in urban areas. I don't I don't see it. Um, it's just that area just hasn't evolved that way. It definitely could be way better than it is now. It can probably do some of that missing middle that Karen was talking about, probably do a little bit of retail, a little bit of office. It's got great possibilities, but it's not going to be a vertically integrated mix. You see just the high roller stuff. Yeah. You know that red star means lazy. You know that. Yeah. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> Region one, I didn't actually have any really good examples of it. Um, you know, BWI takes up a huge land mass in Region one. You've got Arundel Mills sitting there right on the edge of Region one, what Arundel Mills is, is a huge vacuum that just sucks all the retail opportunities out of, out of the whole area. I've seen it happen in many, many places. Um, I'm from Ohio, and if you've ever been to Columbus, there's a place called Easton Town Center. It's just a gorgeous town center. But if you drive two miles outside of Easton Town Center, it is a desolate wasteland. And every retailer got sucked into Easton Town Center. Mm -hmm. Arundel Mills has that kind of effect. So, fortunately, I don't think we're that desolate around it, but it's creating a lot of residential opportunities right. in Region 1 because of it. I don't know that there are a ton of retail opportunities. I don't have a Arundel yeah. Mills is also the most popular, most popular yeah. destination in, in Maryland. Yeah. So, yeah, it's like six million visitors. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, I mean, it, people think yeah. Ocean, Ocean City, like, City, but they used to be the City. Inner Harbor for like the longest time downtown. Down down there. Yeah. Well, from the day Run Mills opened, it's it's been number yeah. one. Where people literally travel to go there. Yeah, it is. And it's right it's right there. There. yeah and I guess I'm, that's making the point that the type of retail, I mean, that doesn't mean reach a village center type or curbside retail network around it. It's just to get any sort of movement on retail around my run of mills is going to be hard. So, traffic county, for some examples that I was talking about before, this one right here is Annapolis. Right, so this is West Street. That's 111,000 cars a day. Yeah. That's why all that retail is sort of in that general vicinity. Yeah, right. All that traffic up top. That is um, Route Two. So that's over by Marley Station. So I mean, even there, there's not a ton of traffic. 40,000 cars a day. It's a lot. It sounds like a lot, but honestly, compared to this, it's not a lot. Right. So that's why Marley Station is probably not a great sort of retail. 
If you're going to redo that mall, it's not going to be a ton of retail. It's going to be mixed use. Yeah. So it will be some retail, but it's probably going to be mostly residential, office, other things too. Um, and then this is near DWI. So tons of traffic on 97, obviously, 130,000 cars a day on 97. So that's why Quarterfield Crossing does really well. It's right off the highway in and out. But once you get off 97, the traffic really drops down. So again, that's another challenge to depends on the retail you want, right? If you want the sort of big national ones, they're not going to be attractive to get much into these areas just because of traffic. But, you know, the other problem is, you know, where your traffic is going, you're going to and from, you got Fort Meade right there. And you're stuck. So and you're stuck. You're, you're not going to, you're not going to have any, you can't put any retail there. So you're going to, you're going to be retail. So these are some costs. Um, I put this over here on the left in red, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But this is just, it's a project that would be what I would consider sort of a village retail project with some pad sites, multi tenant building. It's, I know you probably can't read it, but I'll just run down. It's like basically the way this sort of pencils out is it generates about the, the average rents are somewhere between $32 and $35 a square foot. Does everybody know what I mean by that? What a per square foot rent is that a retail tenant pays? Mm -hmm. If I'm renting 2,000 square feet, and I have a $40 square foot rent, I'm paying $80,000 a year in rent, right? So that's that's what we, to build new construction, we need to see rent sort of in that $40 a square foot range to make it work. What, what's, here, the, what's the profit you need to add that? Well, I'll show you. So right now, this is these $32 to $35 rents. It generates about $700,000 a year in net operating income. So that's after you pay expenses to operate the shopping center and all the taxes and all those sorts of things. Generates about $700,000 in net income, but it took about $11.5 million investment. So it's simply seven divided by 11 is a 7% return. I could take $11 million and put it in a money market account right now and probably make 6%. Okay. So are you going to take all of the risk to build, to lease up, you have vacancy risk, you have all those risks to make a 7% return, it's really hard. To do. That's why I was saying that's at those rents though. You get $40 a rent, $40 a square foot rent. Now, okay, there's some risk reward there. Maybe if you're going to push this number up, it drives your profit up. And so that makes it more attractive to possibly build new retail. And so that's the tipping point. And there aren't a lot of places where you're getting $40 a square foot rent in the end of the right now. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. It's just now it's difficult. So the other thing I want to point out, this pink line right here, which I know you can't read, that's a million dollars in permits and fees. So if I want to build that new building, I'm paying connection charges, I'm paying permit fees, I'm doing all these other things. If my total costs are 11 and a half, and that's basically almost 10% of my cost, almost 10% of my costs are just paying permits and fees. It's a challenge. It's causing, it's causing pain on the performer to get some of this stuff to work. And again, this is an example of what I would consider a village retail. A lot of people would like to see their curbside retail. So you either need to get higher rents or you need to drive these costs down to start making them more opportunity, more opportunity. So this is just a more example of that. All tenants look at what's called health ratio. So it's the percentage of their rent, of the percentage of their revenues they can pay in rent. And the different categories can pay more. So the example is, is you know, if I'm paying $100,000 a year in rent and I have a 10% health ratio, I need to make a million dollars in revenue in order to pay my rent and still be a healthy business. So that's what that says. So in the next one is just an example. So based on that other one, sort of these are the revenues that those tenants that we modeled would have to get to hit that. But if I wanted to get $40 a square foot, which I said was my tipping point, I need $500,000 more a year in revenue. On that number. So 1.8 is got to be 2.3 million. So that restaurant's got to generate 2.3 million dollars in sales to be healthy. So that's just sort of an example of that. Yes. How do these numbers change based on redevelopment? I know you're talking new, but is it more is it just more it's all in your cost? So so that performer I showed you originally, the those numbers were based on just buying land and building them. So there's a land cost and then there's vertical construction costs. If it's a redevelopment, it just goes into your cost side. So now I've got to buy the land, tear down the buildings, and then do all that work. It's just part of your cost. It goes to that 11 and a half million bottom line number. 
Now, if I own the land, let's say I own this land and it's a dilapidated shopping center, I've owned it for 50 years, then I at least don't have to buy the land, but I do still have to come up with the money to demolish everything and new construction. So it's ultimately, it's just another cost that you have to do. Any more questions on the cost or numbers? So restrictions and exclusions, we talked about this before, so I don't need to talk about it much more, but sort of like a grocery. So, you know, a lot of people don't realize Whole Foods has a restrict, doesn't even let people have a, you can't have a bakery next to Whole Foods. There's a nothing bun cake in Annapolis. I don't know if you've seen it. We had to go get permission from Whole Foods to be able to put a nothing bun cake there because they have a bakery exclusion. They don't want people competing with them to sell anything they sell in their store. You know, juice, smoothie, all those things. They're smart. They're smart. <laughs> They're smart and we're done. That's exactly right. Um, you know, an off-price retail like a Ross will want to be the only off-price clothing retailer in the entire shopping center. That's probably the challenge. Quite mm -hmm. the fact with that. Dicks won't let anybody else sell sporting goods. You know, it's, you know, even restaurants are getting into it. So if you have a, a hibachi restaurant, we're the only Japanese mm -hmm. in the restaurant. Mediterranean, same way. They all want it. Salad bar, if you get a chop, you better believe they're going to have a restriction that no one else can sell salads in the shops. No? And it's happened on that. Now, those are just inclusive. Restrictions are issues they, they want to control their parking lot. Right. So they don't want you putting anything in the parking lot right out of their front door. They don't want, they don't want certain businesses being right next to them that will then park in their parking lot and go to that business. So they have a lot of uh, restrictions there, they call them their critical areas. Um, it's, it's, we don't see it as much in Toronto, but we're going to see it. The new urban design likes to flip everything around. Nobody likes to see a parking lot anymore. Everyone likes to see like sort of buildings with entrances right on streets and sidewalks. Well, retailers hate that. They absolutely hate it. Retailers love it when people either walk down the street or drive down the street and see a big field of full cars in a parking lot yeah. that people can just get out of their car, run right in the store, and they love it. So it's been a challenge to convince jurisdictions, well, if you want Whole Foods in your jurisdiction, you're going to have to get off some of these new age design things because Whole Foods not coming. They're not putting an entrance on the back side of their store so people can walk off the sidewalk. Into it. They want an entrance on the parking lot so people can wheel their car out to their car, get in and get out. And they want convenience. That's what they reach. So there, there, there's that. Thing. But um, that's not going anywhere. We're going to have to find a way to sort of get everybody back to the table. But I think that's actually it. Yeah. It's interesting that Annapolis Town Center is that why mm -hmm. the Whole Foods, when you when you pull in, like let's say from River Road, it's a restaurant, restaurant, and it's like furniture store, furniture store, various you know random stuff. And then Whole Foods is kind of isolated with the parking garage and everything. Well, yeah, I mean, the requirement of that Whole Foods is, you know, they have a parking lot underneath yeah. the store, too. So they would only come there if they had their own, and no one, I know people probably do park there, but it's restricted parking. The only people who yeah. park under Whole Foods is Whole Foods customers. And then if you go directly across the street from them, they have all that express parking that is strictly reserved for Whole Foods. So if they can get that, then they're okay. They don't, they don't, have a problem with um, sort of other users around them, yeah, per se. Yeah. The restaurants share that lot, like mm -hmm. next to the cemetery. They do. Yeah, and then Whole Foods has its like. Correct. Yeah, but everyone going to Whole Foods is either parking under Whole Foods or they're parking in the one directly across from where the wine store is. They yeah. park in the back of the Whole Foods. Any other questions? Are there any more plans yeah. for Glen Burnie Mall? I know that there's been some upgrades updated stores. Are you familiar with any like come to mind, any plans that you know of? I personally am not. I haven't seen any recently. But you know, there are a lot of malls. I, I would say there are a lot of malls in this county that are ripe for redevelopment mm -hmm. just because there hasn't been a ton of redevelopment in the last 10 years or so. And we still have good population, we still have good income, we still have good education levels. So it's really going to be um you know, I think some of these older malls, you're going to have a chance, at least the strips, you're going to have a chance to revitalize some of them. Yes. Now, like the area, like if you think about the areas near Fort Meade and at Bay, the strip of 175, where there really isn't a lot of, I mean, there's retail, right. but it's 
like older, maybe end of more independently yeah. owned businesses, yeah. but there's a lot of traffic. Like, are there any plans to do anything with that area, or can you not really touch it since there's already? Well, if they're they're renovating that now. Well, the 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 well mm -hmm. where the car wash is. Yeah, I mean, it, it's I mean, there's so many different owners involved. Okay, that's part of the problem. Is it's you either have to have some master plan where someone takes control of all of it right. to do it, or you have to, like, with something like that, if it's sort of individually owned properties. Yeah, like the the yeah there are grants. I mean, I'm, I'm by the way, I'm, the, I'm on the economic development board for Anne Arundel County, and there are grants that economic development does give out for storefront renovations and to improve certain properties. And that's a good way to help beautify and improve. Um, but for a developer to get interested in a site like that, it's just, it's a lot of work for very little returns. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Alyssa Jones from Region 3. Um, one of the questions I had for you is, we're talking about the profit only being at 7.13% um, for the developers, which isn't something good. I think one of our goals is to try to get affordable housing to our communities and um, the retail space kind of goes hand in hand with that. As the as a developer who has a lot of things going on in the region, how do you think the SAC could in, have some kind of help towards you guys? Are you looking for like less permitting fees from the county? Are you looking for just completely rezoning um, spaces? Or what do you think that we could actually do to help? I mean, it's a couple things. So a, a revitalization bill in the county would probably help. Anything that would lower the cost of acquiring an existing shopping center and redeveloping it would make redeveloping an existing dilapidated shopping center that much more attractive and to get people interested. In it. You know, are there public funds that you could bring to the table that would, like maybe there's some major infrastructure improvement or road improvement that needs to be done. So that that's one option. The revitalization bill could do things like, you know, if it's 100% impervious, for example, it's an existing shopping center that's a covered parking lot and buildings. You know, I know everyone wants to bring everything up to current stormwater management these days, but there are ways to say, look, if, if you bring it back to 50% of what it needs to be, then that's improving it from what its present condition is, and it's also an incentive to get somebody to do that. So that that's another opportunity um, to just sort of Again, it's, it's all coming down to the development costs for the developer. So it, anything you can do to lower those development costs makes it private. Thank you. So I mean, the other thing is what I'm, with, I'm kind of this not maybe not a, a full shopping center, a full you know mall or anything, but the smaller um, you know standalone lots that are, are around the county, mm -hmm. some of them are a major eyesore. Um, and they're like, well, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> and, no, and nobody's, there doesn't seem to be any plans. The past 20 years, there's no plans. No, and it, that kind of gets back to those uh, economic development grants are one right. way, but I mean, getting a developer interested to go pick up one lot at a time, at least a developer like us, is difficult. Now, maybe there'll be some entrepreneurial commercial developers right. who see these as opportunities. But the problem is, too, is, is it's all based on the rent that you can pay. So unless the area as a whole improves, that will drive up the rents. Making any great investment into those existing properties is that much more difficult. I mean, like just off the top of my head, I mean, at um, Old Mill and Veterans Highway, there's a couple of, you know, there's McDonald's there and everything, but then there's the one gas station that shut down, it's been shut down, shut down for 10 years, and it's, it, it's just, it just looks like, I mean, it, it's like, as soon as you're trying to come into that neighborhood, it's like, oh, this doesn't look good. You know? No, I agree. And honestly, that's probably right for anything, <laughs> pretty much anything. And I don't know if there's issues with, you know, because anytime an old gas station goes out, you have to remediate, so you have to remove all the tanks, you have to go that whole program. So I don't know what the story is there, and maybe someone doesn't have the money to remediate, which is added to the cost. But you're right, it's a perfect corner. Um, but it, again, it's probably the type of retail that's going to go there is is probably a fast food with a drive-through. Yeah, right. I mean, it, it's right. just it's just because of 
It's a relatively small, I know it's, it's yeah. a decent sized lot, but it's relatively small. Yeah. There's not much you could do there. It's on a really good high intersect, uh, traffic yeah. intersection, yeah. good access. That's probably what it wants to do when it grows up. Yeah, yeah. when it grows up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's the, just the dispensary right down the street from it. So, you yeah, know, it's just saying. Yeah, I'm just saying. I'm just telling you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, at this point, we're going to take a very quick break. Um, so again, always like to start where we've been, where we're going, and then do this. Uh, this gets you familiar with some of the terms that we're going to be using then when we roll out the maps next next month and start making some decisions about uh, any potential rezonings in some areas, as well as some other policy designations that we have on the farm map as well. Go through a vision statement. Uh, we'll take public comments. We'll approve the um, meeting notes from the last one. We didn't want to sort of bog everybody down with the joint meeting. Um, and then we'll talk about some of our next steps. So again, you've seen this, this graphic. We're just lying that bar right down. Uh, give you an introduction to land use and zoning, and then the next couple meetings is where we'll actually be a little more hands-on around the map, um, marking it up, and actually voting on, on some potential uh, rezonings throughout the region. Um, another graphic, I think we've got this up on our Region 1 hub site, uh, just sort of shows you more of a flow chart. Um, granted, we're going to be talking about the vision that today um, but that middle box sort of we're, we're doing a lot of this all together as well but then obviously the two updates plan land use map and comprehensive zoning that's what we're going to be starting on next month we've developed we've been developing these draft goals and strategies as we've been discussing um, during these topical meetings like transportation housing the ones that we've also been shopping out to the public and having our drop-in sessions and questionnaires on as well and then again, sort of towards the fall when we get into our legislative phase, where uh, it goes through the planning advisory board who may rec make a recommendation, and then ultimately county council who approves the plan, as well as the uh, new zone. Okay, how does that look for folks in the back? Again, now that we've lost a few folks here, if you can't see it, strongly encourage you to, to scoot up um, to see some of this text. So. The three, three designations we're going to be talking about, again, over the next couple months are development policy areas, and we also have development, uh, development policy area overlays. We have planned land use, and we have zoning. So development policy areas, these are our broad categories. Just have a few of those, and it just sort of identifies where the county envisions, where you all envision, development, redevelopment, and sort of preservation happening throughout the county and, and specifically within region one. Um, this is part of the plan, the region plan. Plan land use, we're gonna sort of now get a little more focused. This identifies what type of development we sort of anticipate within these development policy areas or within the county. So for example, um, you might have category of commercial. Within commercial, the next box over, the next column over is zoning. You might have four categories, five categories of commercial zoning districts. I'm going to go through some examples here in region one in a little bit. But again, just sort of understand that there's there are these broad and then working to specific types of designations. Um, the first two, very policy based zoning, is actually then how you can actually develop your property that is the law and and how you develop your property um it, within the code article 18 permitted uses what you can can't do on your property and then how you can build on your property any type of setbacks what the density is we heard a little bit about that this evening um items like that sort of your bulk regulations how high your building can be. So development policy area, this is this is our snapshot of region one. So your purple area is critical economic 
this is, again, just that very broad category to identify where our economic hubs, our engines are, or generators are within region one. Neighborhood preservation is really to just identify where we have our established neighborhoods, where we really don't see a lot of uh, redevelopment or new development happening at a very intense scale. You might have some vacant lots within some of these neighborhoods, or you know, gentleman mentioned a, a vacant gas station that might get redeveloped, that might be in a neighborhood preservation, but we're not expecting any type of large office parks or any type of town centers being uh, developed within that this uh, sort of um, uh, peachish color of neighborhood preservation. Um, so critical economic here around BWI and, and the business parks around there, neighborhood preservation being your established neighborhoods. And then we have another category of critical corridor. And this was um, Karen being part of uh, the, the Citizen Advisory Committee during Plan 2040 um, can speak to this a little bit, but it's really to identify those highway corridors or those road corridors where there is that, you know, if there was redevelopment to happen, really identifying how that redevelopment happens so that it doesn't then adversely impact sort of the, the road network in that area, how to redevelop some of the blighted areas, especially here along the Ritchie Corridor. But again, keeping in mind how that impacts uh, surrounding properties as well as the road network. And then this is also, uh, Curtis Bay is also in that critical economic area as well. So like I mentioned, we have development policy areas. Again, we've got our critical economic, neighborhood preservation, critical corridor. And then we have our overlays, just to sort of allow or identify to help explain um, some additional policy that we see um, or help policy to help guide certain development within certain areas. So for example, our red diagonal area in region one, we just had it in one area along a Ritchie Highway. Again, sort of develop having that policy so that in the future it can guide development so that it's a little more walkable, pedestrian scale, again, taking in, into account the, the transportation network, making sure that that works within that area. Transit-oriented overlay is your red crosshatch, mainly around your, your train stations and your light rail stations. And what we again envision there is more of your compact, walkable, uh, pedestrian oriented type of development. Again, we've talked about that quite a bit, I think over, sprinkled throughout a lot of our conversations. So again, this is developed, and, and I'll mention here too, is our development policy areas, development policy area overlays and plan land use, which we're gonna talk about next, were adopted about almost three years ago um, during plan 2040. Our opportunity to is now working with the, the local stakeholder advisory committees is identify whether some of these areas need to be changed or whether they are accurate and you all agree with them. So for example, in region two, uh, there was a village overlay in the Jessup area. And a couple of the stakeholders within Jessup said, look, you know, the horse is really out of the stable on this one. We really don't see that the Jessup community sort of adheres to this village center overlay designation, and maybe we need to get rid of it. So if you do look at the region two plan, you don't see that village center overlay. And I'm just bringing that up again, just in case um, during our discussions, you can say, you know, these aren't necessarily set in stone. We can talk about those, change them, however you want to tweak them. <laughs> Land land use, like I said, now we're getting a little more specific. We're seeing a lot more color on our maps. Um, this really does guide our development patterns uh, within the county. These are designations, everything from state conservation, where we have, where we envision um, or reflecting what where our conserved areas are on, on in the county, and then our various degrees of residential. So er everything from low dense or sorry rural density areas 
um, up to our high density areas where you max out the uh, the density within our zoning districts up to 22 units per acre. We also have mixed use areas. Again, that's a term that we've been using a lot throughout this, uh, the time that we've been meeting. Town center, we don't have a town center uh, within region one. There is one in region three, Glen Burnie. Our other town centers are Parole and uh, Odenton. And then some of our other uh, designations. So again, then as we're getting into zoning, I can't bring up the zoning map. It, it, it was just a kaleidoscope of, of colors here. But um, again, I think hopefully folks have, have a general understanding then of some of our, our zoning districts. And I like to include this chart up here because it sort of crosswalks between our plan land use and then what zoning district is, is consistent with that and then the anticipated uses um, that we expect within uh, those designations. So for example, with high density residential, your, your consistent zoning districts are gonna be R15 or R22. You can build 15 or 22 units per acre um, within those zoning districts. So we, we typically see multifamily residential, but you may also see mobile home parks, um, private institutional facilities could also be uh, within those anticipated uses. So those are a few of the residential districts up top. And then our commercial zoning districts, um, we've got everything from C1 to C4. It's not, the C1 through C4 isn't necessarily based on intensity. You might think C1 would be your lowest intense, C4. Um, is your most intense, and it generally is, but it's more also uh, based on the characteristics of your commercial and where it may be located. A couple other zoning districts within the commercial, what would also be consistent with commercial plan land use is small business, SD, um, which sort of creates more of that transition between uh, residential neighborhoods and some of your local or neighborhood type of commercial mm -hmm. zoning districts. Um, we have three industrial zoning districts, W1, W2, W3, and those range from just a general office park to light industrial, maybe some contractor yards, to some of your more heavy industrial uh, uses like a transfer station for, for waste management. Um, so I, I'm not going to go through each one of these, but again, just to sort of show you that there is some of this consistency uh, between your plan land use, as well as then the zoning districts uh, that would be consistent with that and the types of uses that we would expect within those, uh, within those designations. Okay, how does this look to folks in the back? Come on up if you're squinting. <laughs> All right, so this is um, within the Orchard Beach area. Our development policy area, again, I'm, I'm going to go through three examples and I'll leave the definitions up there just so you can become a little more acquainted with it. But our broad category is Orchard Beach. It's a well-established neighborhood, residential. We identify that as neighborhood preservation. Uh, low to medium density residential is the plan land use and the consistent zoning that you would see there is R5. So you sort of see how we come to some of these, um, these decisions or how it's all been consistent forward and backwards. Makes sense so far. These are some wonky terms. So feel free to shoot a hand up if, if you do have any questions. Yeah. There is a quiz here, <laughs> starting now. So race road over uh, in the Western part of the county, critical economic, we then have what might what would make sense for critical economic something that's you know generate is a uh, big economic hub could be uh, could be industrial could be commercial plan land use in this particular case it's an industrial plan land use designation based on office parks in that area. What would be some general zoning 
districts that would be consistent with industrial. We're out. We're out. Oh, okay. Yeah, the other street. Yeah. No, no, no. Two We've got our three industrial zoning districts W1, W2, W3. And again, because this is primarily our, our office business park, uh, that falls within the W1 uh, zoning district. Okay, let's go for one more. This one's a little trickier. Uh, this is the Cromwell Center we've talked about. We talked when we talked about redevelopment opportunities and how that might look in the future. So back when we did Man 2040, we sort of had that in mind. We're here today because we want you all then to help refine this vision. So in this particular case, the Cromwell Center is, is actually kind of this um, arrowhead type of shape. And then um, the train, the light rail station is across the street. So that's neighborhood preservation. We didn't see much change necessarily. Transit oriented overlay because again, given its proximity to the light rail station, there might be that opportunity for redevelopment. And again, the type of development that we envisioned during plan 2040 was mixed use. Now, because we didn't get into zoning during plan 2040, this is the current zoning. You've got a mix of C3, some R1 uh, that's over the school, and then a vacant parcel, the light rail station is W1, and then uh, to the north uh, where we have some warehousing or some other industrial, which is W2. So clearly this is gonna be one of those areas that we can tackle going forward and say, well, if we want mix, if we want um, the zoning to be consistent with the planned land use, then maybe one of the mixed use zoning districts makes sense here. And to what extent? And maybe what type of mixed use zoning district? Or maybe there isn't one out there yet, or maybe there isn't one on the books in Anne Arundel County just yet, uh, which is the way Region 2 approached mm -hmm. it, saying, look, none of the mixed use zoning districts are really quite appropriate, but in the future, because planned land use is just sort of saying, in the future, this is what we envision the, the types of uses where the development to look like or be the characteristics. Maybe we see, you know, um, two to three story buildings, density, you know, 15, 20 units per acre, something like that. Um, and we can go through the, the specifics of some of these, these mixed use zoning districts, but you all can, can also just say, look, Maybe there's nothing right now that fits what we envision uh, within the zoning categories, but we can describe it within the plan so that when, um, when there may be amendments to the zoning districts in the future, one could be applied to this area. Good. I have a question here. You've got 8th Avenue up there and Dorsey Road. Yeah. From the right through there. And then you've got the... the for those that don't know the area that well, you've got the green, it's the green slash that's running across the diagonal, down across the bottom. Okay. And then that tan spot that's down in that corner, keep going over to the side right there. That's the county part that was talked about yeah. by uh, Greenberg and Gibbons. Um, I'm just trying to think, I don't want to say out of the box, but you know, there's not much really green space in there. It's transmission lines and different things like that. And yes, we do need green mm -hmm. and all this other kind of stuff. But would it make sense for the two regions, since we're overlapping regions at that part, to kind of talk about those since they're yeah. basically adjacent to each other? Because if they're going um, yeah. uh, high rise apartments and we think we need I don't know, single family in there, whatever. And I, I know that's not the case, but I mean, they're right. so adjacent that there needs to be some overlapping conversations with those areas. Right, exactly. And there might be some other areas uh, by the Brandon Shores area where, where we might want to have that discussion as well. Yeah, so, um, okay. with, within the uh, briefing documents, it said that um, generally mixed use requires uh, 10 acres. Um, is that, um, but there's exceptions. Is that something that could potentially be a problem with exceptions being requested um, and who will regulate that? 
So again, that's that's one of those things where during the region two process, we looked at some of the requirements and we said, you know, maybe this just doesn't fit the way it's written now. And in plan 2040, there are uh, recommendations to revise the mixed use zoning districts. So we know that as a county, we need to start that. Um, and I think that is something that we can tackle and echo in the plan and say, you know, maybe again, in some of these areas, it may not meet specific um, requirements, but this is our vision. Maybe it's a five acre parcel. And I mean, sort of like what some of our speakers were saying today, especially Eric, where uh, maybe some of these zoning districts aren't working and you're not seeing the type of development that you all envision because of these restrictive requirements, right? And so that's what we want to hear from you all is what does need to change in some of these areas? And I mean, what do you envision in some of these areas? I, I mean, I see like and hear and, and, and know the need for the housing and, and the mixed use makes awesome sense to me. Uh, it's just yeah. like, I don't see um, 10 acre plots in Brooklyn Park. Yeah, exactly. So this, you know, the concern um and and maybe moving more to that curbside for that that in our specific area but i'm just trying to put it all together yeah. exactly yeah. i just wanted to say about this is like a perfect example of you know we have the commercial and the industrial and the transit oriented overlay but we have a neighborhood preservation development policy area this is one of those ones that we should look at and say that that should be development you know, we're in neighborhood right. preservation because we're not trying, you know, we're, we're trying to have a growth area with commercial and industrial and the light rail right there. Right. And, and I'll mention too is within our development policy areas, we've broken them on, we've broken them down into targeted growth and areas that aren't targeted for growth. So for example, our critical critical economic is targeted growth. And whereas neighborhood preservation and critical corridor are not targeted growth areas. So right, what Mary Lee is, is essentially suggesting um, using some of the terms that we have in plan 2040 is while neighborhood preservation is not targeted growth with the overlay transit oriented, it does make it targeted growth. So I but I think I understand your point still, right? Okay. Okay, so as we go through this process, we're going to be uh, talking about several different types of changes that the office planning and zoning will be making. Um, and then ultimately, on one of these last slides, talk about uh, some of the suggested changes that you will have. But like I had mentioned is, and this is a good example, if I go back to the previous slide of plan land use was adopted in plan 2040 a couple of years ago. Um, but again, the zoning wasn't updated at that time. So this is an example um, elsewhere in the county where you have planned that. So this is the plan 2040 PLU, plan land use, um, very nicely runs along the boundaries, really uh, adheres to what is currently on the ground. So you're high, you have high density residential, for example, here, medium density residential. The existing zoning, though, sort of runs arbitrarily through some of these parcels, doesn't really follow what has actually been built on the ground. So again, so what, what the Office of Planning and Zoning is doing is we're running an analysis where then we can ensure and make some of these recommended changes automatically where then the zoning would then be consistent and snap to the parcel boundaries of Plan 2040. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Because again, plan land use needs to be consistent with zoning and zoning needs to be consistent with plan land use. It's a state requirement. 
another thing that we are also doing, and there was a bill adopted last year that, that helps with this a little bit, is if you were to open up our zoning layer online, you might see, again, the geometry of this shape, you know, really kind of roughly matches the boundary of the parcel, but you see that it's kind of shifted a little bit. So we, we've, we realize that probably this entire parcel should be open space and, and it should be better snapped to the parcel lines. So we are undertaking that analysis as well, where we're able to clean up these slivers to a certain degree, okay? Where we can then essentially make that recommendation that that entire parcel should be OS and not split zones on the left-hand side, okay? Again, also, if you were to look at our online or our zoning map, you might find these big green squiggles throughout the county. And they were based on what, like 1984 FEMA floodplain maps. Some of these environmental resources, you know, may not, things have changed since then. So they may not adhere to these types of boundaries anymore. And we, office planning and zoning and planning in general, you don't typically like to see split zone properties. So again, we're also doing another analysis where then we're verifying where some of these platted floodplains might be or other uh, preservation areas uh, where it's protected in perpetuity are and just identify those specific parcels as open space rather than having it run through say uh, private property owners uh, backyards, for example. Because we have environmental regulations, then that adequately protect those resources if a property is redeveloped. Okay. Okay. And then one specific example here in Region One with planned unit development. So this is actually one of those that isn't going to be a change, where you have some of these master planned communities like Cedar Hill. Um, and I've got that outlined what the sort of master plan community is in yellow. And you see sort of it's this mishmash of, of zoning districts. And again, it, it sort of cuts through parcels. There doesn't seem to be a rhyme or a reason for it. But because there are certain um, agreements and, and approvals as a result of this planned unit development or PUD, we're not going to make any changes. We're just saying exact, essentially within this boundary, within this PUD boundary, we recognize that, that parcel lines aren't going to be perfect, but we need to protect that just so that we can understand how those agreements and approvals were, were sort of settled on when the project was approved and built. So your yellow is gonna be designated on your plan as a, as a HUD. Uh, so it makes some sense. Uh, so we know what, you know, it is. I mean, you're standing there and explaining it. It makes yeah. perfect sense. But you go back three months later, you know, kind of like, this is a mismatch. Why didn't we do it? Yeah, that's a thought. Um, we didn't necessarily outline uh, item uh, PUDs in our first round of region plans, uh, but we have made note of it. But I think your point is taken is, is maybe it does make sense to uh, have a more significant um, sort of recognition that they are PUDs. I was gonna say, I'm not saying change the colors, change yeah. the zoning inside that kind of stuff, but it, it could just, just be an outline, outline with a, a color yeah. and that color outline matches PUD, then that explains a lot. Right. Yep. Is there also a thought though of, you know, there's a density on that PD that just make the zone match that so that you have one zone? Yeah. I don't have this happen. Yeah, and again, we looked at it extensively, and it was super complicated. And so we really decided not to touch it. We have published a planned unit development layer that's available on our publicly publicly facing GIS map, so it's out there and explains these issues. But we were worried that if you pick one zoning district, did you pick the right district? You know, so it's we decided during the first round that we would leave these alone. Could could you as uh and maybe this is what you're talking about, Mark, but in the region two plan there was 
small snippets that were specific to partially developed or future developed properties. For example, the Laurel Racetrack. There's like a little paragraph in there to sure. explain what what the intended goal is. Is that a way to maybe address that since it might not be clear from a mapping perspective? Yeah, I think we can uh, provide some type of explanation and uh, identify where where the PUDs are within the region. Okay, and then lastly, the types of changes um, that we'll be making, office of planning and zoning, we may identify certain areas within uh, region one uh, based on, again, change of character, any other type of uh, criteria where we're recommending a type of change, which you, you will see when we do our analysis together. Um, so office planning and zoning, we're making our, change, our recommended changes and again, you all in the next couple months will be making your own recommended changes to the zoning as well. Uh, one other piece of the puzzle here of changes, um, back during, I think, uh, application period closed back in December, but property owners had the opportunity to uh, request a rezoning on their property or an agent would be able to do it on their behalf. So we will be reviewing their applications and you all will be voting on on those as well. Okay. Okay, so before I move on to holding capacity really quickly, any questions on the terms, the designations? You all have the, land, the briefing paper, give that a review. When we meet again in April, I can run through these terms again very quickly just sort of as a nice refresher. Um, and again, if you're still stuck on a couple of things, we can talk through those as well. Um, I would just like more information uh, on the mixed use um, difference, sure. the residential, the transit, the different types. I would just like more, yeah. more in depth explanation of those different types, since that seems to be um, a type of uh, zoning that's really um, needed. Yeah, let me. Um... I don't think that's something I can do this evening for you all, but I think, yeah, exactly. creating some type of like I, white paper or yeah. some type of brief analysis, it's describing them and comparing. Sure. Right. Hmm. I mean, they're kind of self explanatory ish, but there might be something within the mixed yeah. definition that specifically brings it into yeah. the mix. Yeah. So. Let me also give you the um, page numbers of Region 2's plan where they describe, again, maybe at the time because they were saying, oh, maybe this one area, one of these zoning districts doesn't quite make sense, but this is what we envision. And again, that's the same type of narrative you, you all can provide in this plan as well. Sure. Just to give you some an idea of, of what a pretty good group did. <laughs> okay, good to move on to holding capacity. There's a lot of words up here um, and a lot of words over the next few slides. Um, and we, this was also in, I think, your briefing paper for housing, but really boiled down, holding capacity is just another term to say that based on our household forecast, about 20, 30 years, and based on our current zoning, again, based on certain criteria of our zoning, do we have enough density essentially, or is there enough opportunity for people to build homes or housing units on their property to accommodate that anticipated forecast of new households coming to, to the community? So I'm gonna I'm gonna fast forward to this slide and then we'll go back. So what we're projecting is over the next now 16 years, anticipate there being approximately 66 households based on our analysis of the existing zoning districts as is built out, there could be capacity for about 28 house, 2,800 households. So you see that there's now a deficit of approximately 3,800 households, okay? 
So based on people wanting to move to this area, the jobs in this area, and the interest, what we anticipate, how, how much the county growing, zoning currently can't accommodate that growth. Okay. So let me go back then and talk about sort of what goes into this analysis. So we're looking at really vacant land. Um, and again, we've got some metrics here of what I what sort of uh, classifies as vacant land, as well as redevelopment potential. But again, I think you'll sort of can have a general idea that vacant land, that property can either be subdivided or built. Redevelopable potential, we see these properties throughout the region where we think, wow, that's that's just one house on a large piece of property, or you know what, that's a, a blighted shopping center. <laughs> And maybe there might be an opportunity to build townhomes on that or some type of mixed use. Uh, Eric used the term vertically integrated mixed use, where you have, say, commercial or office on the bottom, on the ground floor, and then residential above it. So, again, sort of looking at these two types of um, characteristics and properties throughout Region 1, we were able to run analysis um, to identify where these properties are and what their zoning is to come up with um, uh, that number of, of a housing deficit of, of over 3,000 units. We did, again, obviously take out properties that are owned by the government, um, floodplain parcels that are in open space, for example, and a couple other items. Um, again, just so that we're, we're trying to zero in on that, um, a more accurate number. So we were looking at uh, this applies to all our residential zoning districts, RA, which is our um, least dense zoning district of R22, again, 22 units per acre, as well as then uh, where residential uses are allowed in some of your uh, commercial zoning districts or your mixed use zoning districts, and then Odenton uh, has zoning districts uh, similar to uh, the mixed use zoning districts. Um, so again, we're taking out environmental features, and then we're coming up with this yield factor. And Karen touched on that briefly, saying that um, was it that they get about sixty percent of that gross density, right? So if it's R five or an R five zoning district, maybe they're only able to build three units per acre. Okay. So we take that into consideration, noting that not all these vacant or underutilized properties are going to be developed at their max, because like she said, you've got to take out for roads, parking, um, open space, other items that are necessary on the property. So again, this is how we get back to this number. And again, just want to emphasize this, um, and it's something to consider as we do go through our, our zoning analysis with maps as well as, again, identifying those other designations that are consistent with zoning and really trying to identify, can we make a dent in, the, in this number? Where, where can we make a dent in that number? Again, we talk a lot about some of these competing interests where we want green space, we want affordable housing, we want denser housing, we, but we don't want traffic, we want public transportation. So sort of taking all that into consideration, again, not saying that we need to hit this number, but just sort of keeping in the back of your head that based on these population or these family household forecasts and our current zoning, we are at that deficit of, of amount of units. Question? Yeah. Does any of this analysis, and I know this is new, to take into consideration at all the EDUs that just got approved for the county? I don't think it did take into AD, uh, accessory dwelling units where you can have sort of, if you have a uh, uh, garage separated from the house, if you can convert that into an apartment. Um, did it take into I don't believe it did because there's no. such a new bill. Our yield factors are based on actual projects. So because it's so new, I don't think there were many projects available that we could actually have the yield factor for. So, so this is strictly really based upon the actual real world. Like we're the real world. We're, Real world examples. So the AU bill may be too new for that to 
Um, that's kind of what I figured that, you know, you guys have been doing this for quite a while, but mm -hmm. I really see in some of the, I'm going to say some of the more older established communities that have, and I'll pick on them pick on them, that's where mm -hmm. I live, that I know some of my neighbors are already getting ready to take advantage of it. So density by virtue of the fact of this, right. even though it's not affecting zoning, is going to, to be increased and you know, whether an ADU is counted as one half of the dwelling unit or whatever, because it's kind of like in law or college age kids or whatever to get them out of the house or possibly rentals, mm -hmm. you know, it is going to have a factor on that to a point. Sure. Yeah. And that is one of the tools in the toolbox of providing affordable housing or getting additional units on the market. That's a, that, that is actually kind of a crazy number. If you take, uh, I mean, maybe. What's her name? Nick John Karen's Karen's analysis, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like 60%, three houses per acre. Right? That's that's like a townhouse, right? That's 30, that that's a ton of acreage. What he said, like over a thousand, twelve, I'm, I'm terrible at math, but developable, developable acreage is right. over a thousand. Mm -hmm. In yeah, our region, I think the other sort of startling takeaway from that presentation is that if we're turning out a thousand permits a year, right? It yeah. means it would take right. 3.8 years at that rate to try to catch up um, from the new housing unit. Right. Well, your 30 years is so not we need additional land yeah, cash, true. we need that pace to catch up all the while the county is continuing to grow. And again, just wanted to include a couple other our, our neighboring regions to identify um, where there are those deficits. And again, in Region Two, uh, which is West County, um, your Jessup, Hanover, Maryland City area. Um, again, when we did our zoning analysis um, for Region Two, we didn't we didn't create a, a we didn't get this to zero, right? So. Just understand that you know you're not trying to necessarily get that to zero. I don't know if some of your neighbors would even appreciate that necessarily, but again, just kind of keeping that number in mind. And then in region two, based on their based on the analysis that there is enough housing. So you know, kind of understanding that while we do have this 3,800 number right next door, there isn't that deficit. And also then in Odenton Town Center, for example, that number actually, there's a higher number because you can go to, uh, uh, you can do uh, 22 units per acre in certain areas. So just kind of keeping that in perspective of where you see your community and how big you see your community, right? Is we do have our region plan boundaries, but everything's pretty fluid within this area as well. Okay. Okay. So just to sort of give you a teaser of, of when we meet again in April, we can go through the terms again, uh, give you a quick uh, download of that again. Um, and then we'll review, we'll have paper maps of zoning, land, land use development policy areas, um, poster size, we'll have them up on on our tables and we'll all gather around the tables. We'll have some markers and start marking those up and we'll go through it by community. Um, but what we're gonna, what you all will be voting on then are any potential changes you all recommend, right? You will need to vote. Um, and that is then a, a two thirds vote um, for it to be successful. You'll go through the consistency changes, those types of those various types of changes that I, I mentioned at the Office of Planning and Zoning uh, will be recommending. And again, because some of these might be so minor, it might be a tenth of an acre, it might be a, an acre or so, we'll be noting those on these maps. Um, but again, you can look at those as a batch and say, they do a big old hand wave and say, hey, look, in this one area, yes, we approve these consistency changes, 
you can take it as a batch and single one property and say, you know what, maybe we just need to focus on this one and we have a different opinion than the office planning and zoning. So we can do that. And then, like I said, is we'll be doing, um, we'll provide you with the property owner applications and you all will be voting on those as well. Throughout this process, we do want to make sure that then when you are making a decision, that there's a justification behind it. So that, again, we're just transparent with the public. And when these plans then go out to the public, they understand uh, what, what, your, what your thought process has been. Okay. Um, we'll also then, we'll be in, in a room where there's um, some technology. We'll bring up some interactive maps different layers that we can pop on and off that, you know, if, if you have a certain question, is there sewer service here? Where, you know, where certain things are, we can bring some of those layers up and that can help then inform some of your decision making. Um, like I said, is going back to all the way back here, for example, is if you do recommend a change in zoning, it may necessitate a change in the planned land use, it may necessitate a change in, in the development policy area, or if you start here, it may have an impact on, on the other two designations. So that's why I just say that um, this, this is an iterative process. When you change one thing, let's, we may need to consider and, and make a vote on making a change to the any other one or two designations if necessary. Okay. I also want to stress that um, based on our experience, it's it's best if you we do meet in person. Obviously, we've been doing that, but we have had some folks join us on Zoom. It's very difficult to participate if you're in Zoom. Um, Marilee and, and Jim were part of this process uh, for region two. They can attest that while we do try to have one primary discussion. There may be some offshoots on conversations on the side. As you can imagine, if we're trying to work with our owls here, they may pick up those side conversations. It gets noisy. You don't know who's saying what, what's relevant. Um, so again, really stressing that for this to really be effective, that you all join us in person. You all here, but also talking to the folks um, that weren't able to join us in Okay. Any questions about how we're going to approach this then next month? We'll do a recap, get you all comfortable with it. Jim and Marilee, any words of advice jumping into this? You know, because for the most part, our, our past meetings have just kind of been discussion based, passive. This is now very interactive and in making some decisions, but any. It's probably the, probably the most engaging part of rolling out maps and sharing ideas and thoughts. Mm -hmm. Definitely better to do it in person and huddle around and talk about it. Okay. It also worked well, and we, we just went, we, I think we started at the top and just slowly worked our way down, and we didn't have a lot of conversations. Everybody could right. focus on the properties. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so with that, um, we've got about 40 minutes or so, let's jump into developing a vision statement. Um, just to sort of recap what it is, um, I sort of, I tend to look at it as this sort of umbrella statement that then everything underneath, all your strategies that we're then developing that go at the end of the document, uh, the strategies being those recommendations that we've talked about, are all then sort of aligned with this vision statement so that there isn't this recommendation that um, sort of disagrees with, with what your vision of the community is going to be. Um, so again, really in short, where are we headed? And what do you all envision for your community? Um, Aaron was part of our Plan 2040 Citizen Advisory Committee. This was the vision statement they created Pretty short and sweet. Yeah. And um, trade if I included in the briefing paper I gave you all as an example, but South County's small area plan, this was a sort of a region plan process that was done about 20 years ago. Their vision statement was keep South County rural. That's it. <laughs> cool. So we've got a lot to work with. Um, but again, just to sort of give you some inspiration. Um, again, 
just to provide you some context of how how some of these draft vision statements were created or things to keep in mind. We did have a questionnaire uh, that was out for the public. These were some of the uh, general themes that we had heard back from the public about what they'd like to see region one be in the future or what it is currently. So again, one of the most racially economically diverse areas of the county. We want to focus uh, housing, um, or sorry, focus uh, public transportation around housing employment centers. We, a lot of these things actually you all have brought up to the table in our discussions as well, that public transportation, it just needs to be more reliable. We don't have good roads, there's traffic, there's limited sidewalks, um, economic development, some of our economic, our, our commercial areas are really blighted, they need sort of a shot in the arm, and how, how can they meet the local needs? Um, you know, better grocery stores, even just a grocery store in some areas, right? It's not only just getting better ones, but actually having more uh, fresh food available and readily accessible for folks. Um, and again, recognizing that the airport um, is again one of our one of the biggest uses within this region. Um, it is that economic engine, but again, we do have residential adjacent to it. Uh, we heard from Sean last month about you know any any types of techniques that might be used uh, to sort of buffer them from those residential areas. Uh, housing, I think we've all heard this before, that it, it just isn't affordable. We want our older uh, parents, our other individuals, to be able to, they need to transition out of their single family house, that there is still housing in that community for them. Um, we heard a lot, again, from you all, from all, all the outreach that we did, that housing needs to be well maintained. I think I've heard from everybody that they all know this one house on, on their street or on their corner that just hasn't been well maintained and it sort of brings everything down for the community. Um, and again, there's, there is still always that concern about urban development. Uh, community, social life, quality schools, quality parks, more parks, um, more medical facilities. People see a lot of trash on the roads and in, in, in the waterways and in parks how to maintain or how to manage that. Uh, people really do want access to clean air, water, green spaces, and how to uh, conserve and restore some of our air. So again, that's the public feedback that we heard. Um, and we do have that summary up on our website, as well as the statistics of uh, how people responded to some of the statements that we had, of whether they agree, somewhat agree, disagree, um, strongly disagree. So again, you can find that summary report online, but this is just a summary of, it, of that summary. So as we develop the vision statement, you wanna sort of push yourself in this mindset of if you moved away from region one, came back in 20 years, how are you describing region one right now? Okay, so let me pull up. Uh, okay, so I was mentioning to Karen that when we get to this, the text is going to be small because I wanted to try to get most of it up on the screen. Um, I'm going to blow it up a little bit more, and then we'll go through. Um, here's my full screen. Okay, how does that look for you all? Oh, sort of okay. Okay, so we're going to start with. I, I, let me go back to the survey or the questionnaire that we put out is office planning zoning and your chair and vice chair prepared uh, draft vision statement just that we could have something to react to and start from and sort of add to or subtract. Um, so we're going to, most folks liked um, the first vision statement and over here in the comments section. Um, here were things, here were items that people liked or noted about this first vision statement. So um, again, I, I don't necessarily need to read each one, but just something to keep in mind. And again, we didn't get full uh, responses or responses from everybody on the committee. So again, as we discuss this, feel free to obviously chime in with your, with your own thoughts. Um, I'll, I'll mention a couple here just 
talks a lot about DEI, our diversity um, and inclusion and equity, um, broken down by category. So a nice way to sort of organize some of the thoughts within here. Uh, talks about housing, affordability types, um, but then some of the comments left about what could be improved it might be too long, too generic, um, and some other considerations to include is maybe focus on green space, uh, community engagement, business interests, um, and it does include different types of housing. So with that, Um, this is your discussion, right? I'm going to, I've got, um, I'm going to be suggesting changes just so that, because when we went through region two, we would make a change. Then maybe we said, you know what, maybe let's go back to the original. So let's go through this and go paragraph like paragraph or point and talk about any potential changes that you'd like to make to this vision state. Okay, this is your vision state. You were dropped back here in region one in 20 years. How are you describing? And again, I do want to make the point that, um, you know, the, just starting off using sort of our present tense, right? Because we are now dropped back here in 20 years, it's 2044. And region one is what? Right? Region one is a diverse community. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I think I think this one has like a lot of like target words, right? Diversity, inclusion, things we want to include. This is way too long no. for uh your statement, but we can find a way to I mean, it's, it's better than keep region one nice or suburban, right? Yeah. Um, but I felt out of the three statements, it is fairly broad, but it, it encapsulates a lot of ideas. And when we're talking about what we're doing, it's it's not, you can't laser focus because it includes a lot. You know what I mean? It's different types of housing, different types of commercial, you know, and, and you can't just, I feel it has to have a sense of broadness of what we want to see, right? We want it to be inclusive and diverse and affordable. Um, I want to put the sorry, I want to put this back up because Carrie, right, is if you remember the CAC kind of twisted themselves in knots trying to identify specific things. This is important, this is important. And then it just kind of grows, and then you're like, but this is also important. And why didn't we mention this if we noted this one specific thing? And so then you sort of untie yourself and you come back to something a little more generic or broad. And so, so this is like the the counties. This is the counties. Yep. We're we're going now into our regions. Yep. So, yeah. yeah. So again, I'm not making any pitch that it needs to be this broad or this short. Just want to sort of give you some insight of how some of these other committees have, have wrestled with um, developing a vision state. So what were you suggesting, Dan? I, I <laughs> uh, if we, I mean, develop, I think this is like, this is a lot. I think it's a lot of things that we have talked about in the room as we brought up issues. So to see those things highlighted, the preservation, the equity, all those types of things, um, it resonated. Um, I looked through them and then after I did my vote, I changed my mind because I did it quickly and then I kind of stepped away and thought about it. This one I had ranked as number two because it hit on all those things we talked about. Um, the number three I had as last, but then when I thought about it, it projected what you would see in a, maybe a US news, somebody's report on a community. And it talked about what 
resolving all these things had bubbled up to. And now we're describing ourselves as this prosperous community with places to eat and places to socialize. I think everything that we've talked about from the community standpoint, the end result is to have those sort of outcomes. So I'm, I put that one as last, number three as last, but now after I thought about it in terms of a, a vision statement, um, I like that one better. I think the challenge I had with it before was because I wasn't seeing all these words that we had talked about early on, but the vision statement for me, I think, is to make a statement about the future having resolved or mitigated some of these things, and right. this is what it is now. So. So again, just bringing up uh, number two and mm -hmm. three, uh, just as a reference. Um, back up here to number one. So again, my suggestion is take what this is saying and condense it into a one or two sentence, maybe three sentences. I think that's I mean, because when you get back and you want to describe it, you're not going to go, oh, I came back to 2044 and, you know, we, there's a, we, we, you know, the preservation was great. A lot, and, you know, you're not going to go down a list. Yeah. I don't think that should be how you describe Like, if you had to describe it, you're not going to give a sermon, right? <laughs> um, so it seems like the guiding principles sort of just, define the word in front of it right yeah. so maybe the way mm -hmm. to make it more succinct is to pull each one of the guiding principles up on this brainstorm to yeah, the top, I say that right and then exactly. you've been you've captured all your concepts but you don't necessarily need to define them all maybe that's why it feels so mm -hmm. right along mm -hmm. yeah it's like for example you're already saying in the first line it celebrates individuality fosters inclusivity but then you're down at two for inclusion. So it's kind of overlapping a little yeah. bit. A number one, two, and three, I, I don't want to oversimplify it or you know, be insensitive I, by no means. But we're in a culture where we're all very familiar with DEI, and we're only going to be more familiar with the movement forward by 2040. Certainly we will be. So I think it's okay to pair those together, yeah. right? But they're all the doing it every day. Yeah, I agree with that there with the yeah, so you have like equitable in the second line of right there, and then you have equity in number three. So you're just kind of a little overlap. So so maybe that's a good starting point, right? Mm -hmm. Is if we're looking at bullet points for numbers one, two, and three, and how they fit into this mm -hmm. first sentence, mm -hmm. if there's a way that we can collectively sort of pick and choose a few extra words, maybe from one, two, and three fold them into this first sentence, and then we can maybe move on to, to another chunk of this. Just throw that first, out there. Okay, take the first line, it says celebrates individuality and diversity, fosters inclusivity, and uh, upholds equity. Yeah. Yes. And you can get rid of one, two, and three. Okay. So, yeah. um, I just want to make sure that I, um, Capture these changes um, and diversity. And what else did you want to add here? Fostering, uh, change fosters, fostering inclusivity and upholds equitable opportunities for all. I mean, I wasn't changing anything other than that. So okay. that's the tense there. Okay. Yeah, I don't think you need to say it's a diverse community that also has diversity. Uh -huh. It's yeah. just a community. Yeah, yeah we can yeah. use a different. Is the community? I don't know if I like how that reads either. But right. 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 Oh, yeah. I don't right. know. What are we trying to say there with that? Right. I that, so that, I mean, that he celebrates. I don't know what we're trying to say there. Maybe it's a community that, yeah, our community that celebrates. But thriving, 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 which uh, I'm going to say, yeah, all that way. which celebrates individuality, mm -hmm. and fosters, fostering, I get it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so does that first sentence 
capture everything yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. And one, two, three. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I, I suggested, I believe, that though they are different, they should be compatible and work together. I know that there's opportunities for preservation by itself and economic you know, development by itself, but I think there's a way to mix them together because everything you do should consider one or the other and work together. Uh, so I didn't know if there was opposition to that, but I think every decision we make has to take all that into account. Yeah, and not to nitpick, but if you're celebrating diversity, you're also including individuality. So do we need to include, we celebrate diversity and fosters inclusivity. We need the individually individuality portion, right? Because if you're diverse, well, diversity. Uh, I want to get that. Never mind. You got it. You got it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I, I, I see what you're I, saying. I don't want to be that's like. What, that's what I'm not gonna say. A lot of times, you like try to. It ends up being very wordy because you want to make sure you're not that's leaving that's something out. It's okay. So do you think the leaving or individual? Yeah, what was that? I was that's that's celebrates individual. diversity. Yeah, that's how I see it. Fosters inclusivity. Well, fostering thing. Yeah, I just feel like that. We have Jack down here. <laughs> okay. Three of us. <laughs> we feel like individuality is different from diversity because right. diversity touches on culture uh, more. So I would believe that you can be individual, individuality by yourself. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but if you're celebrating, you, you celebrate individuality, you're celebrating diversity because everyone is different. In their own individual way. We could be different by culture, but I could have a personality or right. a certain yeah. life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's now your individuality. Yeah, but I'm still a part of whatever the diverse, diverse culture, culture is. Right. But as an individual right. with different sure. thoughts and beliefs, you're still celebrating Both a different right. aspect right. of us. But, it, but it's still diversity, right? We have diversity in our politics. We have, sure. so I think. Individuality could still fit in, and I was just diversity. That's my but, thought. But downwards, yeah, here, yeah. I mean, we can leave it in there. Yeah, we're just expressing. Well, that's like a two thirds, just more than you know. And again, this we're is halfway there. <laughs> <laughs> we're but, halfway there. Good job. <laughs> this isn't your last crack at it, right? So, we'll do what we can tonight. We can bring it back on a future agenda. And you know, let it sort of marinate with y'all and, and see if you still like it or want want anything to change. It should be fostered. Fostering doesn't sound right anymore. Let me change the yeah, which fostering inclusivity, yeah. Celebrates individuality and diversity, fosters inclusivity. And do you need the for all? Could you just say an upholds yeah. opportunity? I don't know about that one. That one that's talk about that because I think for all it's a makes a difference. It's important. Yeah, I really I hear you on that. I, I definitely hear you on that. I'm going to come back to that because I feel strong that we like to do those as well. So far, so good on the first sentence, kind of capturing then guiding principles one through three. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now and we're sort of, yeah. Mark, you said that when we're looking at this as if we're 30 years down the road, how we are. So when we use aspire, that means we're still working to work. You know, I, we can work on the tenses. Mm -hmm. I think right like now, you know, okay, gotcha. Let's try to get some gotcha. concepts down. Okay. Right. The second sentence kind of similar exercise to what we just did, right? So four and five really about preserving what you want to preserve in the community and then also noting that there's some degree of expansion and growth. It seems like the second sentence is trying to say that something similar. So you're preserving the charm and character of the neighborhoods while embracing the need for modernization and essential amenities. And maybe there's a growth piece to that. And what does the modernization mean? Like, while well, protecting. <clears throat> oh, and can you add in while protecting the environment? Uh, I think I'm going to barely come back to your question. Yeah. Um, 
I Karen, you said while protecting the environment. Did I see that back in the Yeah. Um, I'm not going to give anything away here. But that's not Karen, do you want to explain modernization? Huh? Right. Merrily had a question about. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear about that. your the term modernization. Um, the need for modernization, I would say, um, basically would be revitalization, retrofitting, like just bringing up the speed to um, what the needs are for. I mean, it might be, if you have to explain it that hard, it might need, need a new word. I mean, but it seemed basic to me. I don't know. Yeah, like all of that. Like, yeah, I may have touched it there yeah. by saying re revitalization and redevelopment. Is that right. one of those? No, I think, that, I think yeah, that's too that's 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 Okay. Yeah, and I think. <laughs> and I would take out yeah, the for providing essential amenities or to provide. Yeah, that's that's execution. Yeah, so like uh, as far as like modernization of like uh, even technological advances, all of that within our community. I mean, I don't know. It just seemed like an all sorts of thing. I don't want to over worry you. Okay, so how are we doing on the second sentence, picking up uh, numbers four in the bottom? Um. Well, it picks up four and it picks up the first part of five. Five jumps down and gets into transportation, which is in the next sentence. So, can I can I make a suggestion that before we finish this statement off, that while we're discussing the last green, uh, while we're protecting the environment, that we give consideration to um, promoting sustainable. Uh, it's a little different than preservation, right? It's Something more. So, how would we fold in sustainability into to this? Sustainable measures, sustainable uh, practices. How do we, how do we want to integrate? Yeah, I'll just throw something out there too. You, you could do it like in a workplace way with revitalization yeah. and um, like environmentally sustainable or yeah. redevelopment yeah. or um, something like yeah. included within the prior, you know, set of. There you go, sustainable so revitalization. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's more to it, right? I mean, there's energy, there's solar, yeah. there's all that goes into it, too, not just development, but yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. It seems like a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We just will keep it all in and then right, we can always kind of map right? get, get the ideas. Yeah. yeah. The only thing I don't see for number five up there is growth. Well, you can always use chat GPT because I mean that will be 2040 for sure. Every <laughs> <time>. <laughs> Do we need the we's and the hours in this thing? Could it just say preserve the charm and character of our suburban neighborhood as well? Yeah, I think we're going to wordsmith that down at a yeah, different level. We're just trying to get the concepts up there first. <laughs> So we got essentially a rate of All preservation right. and expansion. Yeah. Those two paragraphs there already. The only thing I didn't so, get your fifth one is expansion up there, because I guess that's yeah. the thing. Yeah. Revitalization and redevelopment. Yeah, you could, you okay. could say um, suburban neighborhoods while embracing the need for sustainable growth through revitalization and redevelopment, providing essential amenities while protecting the environment. That is, that protecting the environment piece at the end kind of feels forced. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but we could do we sustainable growth through revitalization, redevelopment, providing such or while acknowledging the environment. I mean, you know, yeah, we definitely want to keep that in there. Oh, you, yeah. you, know, you want the, the I just I don't know if that's yeah, something that. we can always put it, could be rewarded, but I see what you mean. Yeah, just forward to someone who left out their chat. Mark, just a quick clarification point. When you added sustainable growth through revitalization, sort of implies that the growth is only coming through revitalization and redevelopment rather than brand new development. Right. Maybe, this, right. Organic development. maybe there's a way to worsen it that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, you got to have that in there too. 
the like sustainable growth. It's almost like and revitalization, and you know, if you kind of want to put it all. I mean, or do you just say we need for sustainable growth, providing essential, uh, providing essential amenities, and you got because if it is everything, then it's yeah, not true. I think I, I like that. I like that too. Okay, so sustainable growth. Does that still make sense? That you need to, um, while providing. Well, then you got while protecting. I'm good. And they said while providing essential amenities and protecting the planet. True. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then again, as we look at four and five, like Sandy mentioned, the last part of the part of five is transportation, which is then the next sentence. So if you do want to. So how do we capture transportation up in the top? Is so that part of the methods? Oh, there it is. I was going to say it's up there, but it's just not in that cell. Okay. Right. It's a um, robust transportation system up there. So if you want to green out four, I think we've got four. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you've got part five up there, too. So, I mean, yeah, you got it. You have to the transportation yeah. piece, right? It said robust transportation okay. on yeah. the first paragraph. Are we up there? Now? I don't know how you might want to tweak transit that. That might be yeah, right. Do you want to explain what robust is or does that work? I mean, it's does it capture accessible, efficient, and environmentally friendly and probably reliable, like we've heard? Uh, so I think robust can just be reliable. Yeah. Uh, can you take robust out and put all three of those words you just said, and then we go from there? <laughs> no. <laughs> accessible, efficient, and reliable. Yeah. Accessible, so, efficient, and reliable. That's ex excellent. That's robust. That's what robust is. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, it's got to be to address the accessible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, accessible, efficient, and accessible. And was it reliable? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, wouldn't efficient kind of encapsulate reliable though? If it's worth efficient, it's running well. Yeah. It's sure. reliable. Yeah. Shouldn't be yeah. Uh, yeah. more efficient. Okay. Accessible. Yeah. No, why accessible, accessible needs to be kept. I think accessible. Yeah, accessible is most important. Over efficient, yes, for sure. I was going to say you can design a system that's efficient, but it's not those efficient does not necessarily mean reliable. Right. 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 All three of them. I this makes sense. This makes sense. We remove totally um environmental because I mean um where you because I was thinking how about adding just eco-friendly do we have that already we have right I think there's like sustainable environmental protection okay I think environment would encompass eco-friendliness it does we're very good at it but that's not for the kids so we don't have that in the in the upper section efficient accessible reliable efficient accessible and I think systems can be changed to options just my opinion, because it's more than just reliable. Like it should system. be reliable, efficient, and accessible. Reliable should be first. I don't know. That's just my opinion. I don't. I don't disagree with you. Okay. 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 Yeah. So be so reliable. Yeah. Then what? Just like it is efficient and accessible. Did I say that right? Yeah, reliable yeah. is first. And then before we move on, um, Nicole had mentioned whether we need to include. Oh. Eco friendly or environmental friendly. Um, so do it's down here, but we don't on. capture it. Yeah, but I mean, I have protecting the environment and upper because it all ties together, right? So, would that not? 
I mean, I read it when you say protecting the environment there that it's it's across the board, whether it's transportation systems, right. building, yeah. whatever. Are, you're protecting that the we are looking to protect the environment while that. we grow. Yeah, for sure. But that but is essential yeah. amenities, which again is essential amenity to me is transportation. Exactly. <laughs> All right, are we good with this bottom section of this sentence here? Has that been captured up above? I am. Should, good. We, should we end it? Connects our community with the period and then the whole education becomes a different. Yeah, I'm thinking I think that needs to be a separate sentence. The other two, it's two. Yeah. I think that two last two number six is missing from the top. Well, sorry. Oh, sorry. What she said. Yeah, no, I was, I didn't mean to. Okay. okay. She can so. I deleted the uh, note about public transportation system Same. in five, and Same. I think we're we're we at the end of this sentence that captures transportation. So moving on to education as a new sentence. Correct. What are the last? Um, yeah. Is it six and seven? What what's after five? So six. So it is just six and seven. Someone, yeah, they're they're gonna gonna combine items. Oh. And I'm just going to do a time check. It is 8.23. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, again, if you guys are on a roll and want to stay, we can keep going. Um, but again, just can I ask a question? keep in mind that we, um, we still have to just approve the meeting notes oh, and okay. have to we'll let you know. Yeah. Subject you. to the chair's discretion. Yeah. A quick um, note. Um, I don't know if it's worth adding, but employment centers are a pretty big part of Region 1. And when we're talking about transportation in there, I think we're going to abbreviate that sentence, but we may want to bake in towards the end that employment centers are part of the community. Uh, connectivity to them is a, is a big part of transportation as well. Uh, this is, might sound crazy, okay? When we have the essential amenities up there, right? Uh -huh, that was they take out while providing essential amenities. We are we have some need for sustainable growth while protecting the environment, and take essential uh, amenities and make it part of the transportation piece where we're connecting our community to connect our community to employment centers and essential amenities. That sound like a right. but this uh, but that's to grow them too. Yeah, yeah, that's the growth. That's, that's the economic the, development. It's, it's access to versus providing it. Correct. Yeah, I mean, like yeah. the the term sustainable growth is kind of broad, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and so are the amenities, so. though. I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the amenities could be anything. Mm -hmm. They're not just transportation yeah, related. <laughs> it could be parks and. Things, yeah. right? I was grocery yeah. stores yeah. and stuff like that. that. Right, because so I feel like the doesn't see stuff. So just it, and we're addressing we what the issues are now. Right. It's hard to get but to these essential amenities, right? There aren't any, so we need to have them. They need to be. <laughs> So if you put leave employment centers right there, period, and then start a whole other sentence, education systems, but we got reworded some kind of way, but educate an educational system that you know what I mean? Investment right? in yeah, an investment in our education. Systems. There you go. And our educational system. And somehow we have to have close. I'm having a hard time with putting essential and amenity together because they're like opposites. I mean, how can you have something that's essential and then it's an amenity? Not, they don't exist together. Essential services. And then amenity is like actually essential services and it's, it's being used in the context. Can I make a suggestion to the chair? And, and I know you're. You had made it's a suggestion for y'all. I mean, this. Uh, no, I mean, yeah, looking for it, given the time uh, and the hour. Uh, yeah, I feel like we're all providing a lot of good feedback uh, that could be potentially beneficial for us to take 
a revised version of what we see back and come back next time with our thoughts that we have some fresh ideas that we come up with our own because everyone has some great ideas. And I think you've paired it back now where we might actually be able to do our own editing of this and come together with our ideas and kind of piece yeah. it together more collectively the next time rather than sitting around kind of hammering out tonight. Yeah. Just, just thoughts. That's a good idea. And you, but then you run the risk of 15 yeah. new one paragraph I would not be proposing that we do that. No. I'd be proposing that we wrap up exactly. what we've created and using what's at the end mm -hmm. to tie it all together. Mm -hmm. You forgot something. That's my recommendation. Right. Question. Um, how does everybody feel about that? I like that. I think you all have gotten the right, well, I would say right neutral redirection. So to clarify what what you'd like me to provide you With this after this revised statement, yeah. track changes, mm -hmm. get rid of them, give us if, a clean copy. If you and what's remaining, and Mark, I, I think that I'm just suggesting if you feel that you can somehow put those last two, yeah. or at least yeah. the last one, but sure. like number six kind of is educationally related. Okay, so but, you, um, you'd like for OP's office planning and zoning sure. to you want to incorporate that last part and then yeah. bring it back. Pull this in. Send you a clean copy sure. in the next week or so, yep. and then maybe at our next meeting we can just kind of tweak it a little bit more. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
your vision, your vision statement sounds great, but me, you know, I implement. I don't know what to say. I'm no, so you're talking. fine. And we thank you for your comments. And your time is over for your comment. However, um, if you have additional comments, if you want to submit more of your um, your writings, then you can submit them to. Um, yeah, so at the bottom yeah. is uh, Erica, Sam, and my email right. goes great to region one. So if you see the email, if you want to close your write it, you know, that's fine. You can submit those. Okay. And okay. okay. we'll also yeah. that. And you should. And thank you. Can I ask a question? Usually it says community meeting, but it's not a community meeting, just you it, guys. It's it, nothing more than this. So we do take public comment at the end. So oh, we do you. hear the process. Okay. And you can participate um, by way of how you're doing right now with comments. Sometimes, sometimes people like to make public comments. It feels better being in person and all that. But you're more than welcome to submit information. You don't have to comment. Can you tell us where the next opportunity to make comments again? Uh, yeah, I can give that to you later once we wrap up. We can hang out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Quick question. Please, I have a meeting at some I'm in a community meeting. I don't know, like a person I say, you guys go away say participate. something like what's going on to happen, and then the community will, um, public will like, right. stay there, like uh, concerns and all that. And then, you know, after okay. that's what it was like. That seems more like you guys discussing what's supposed to do. Okay. Exactly. Right. It's a board meeting that takes public comment. Oh, okay. Right. Thank, Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Sure. Sure. I mean, given the specific nature of the question and recognizing that the county has a traffic vision, is there any opportunity we can try to connect them with, with yeah. that particular staff member that might help facilitate yeah. at least a response? Right. And I think we do have uh, your contact information. I and mean, he reached out. We received that message. So, yeah. And they will direct it if you email they, to the information, they'll direct it to the traffic list. I hope so. <laughs> I try. I've been trying this for years since 2004. So I think so. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. Let me go over to Zoom. Let's see if can... nobody joined us virtually. They all flipped in. We did have a few. People, yeah, some people. They flipped over to uh, region three. Yeah. Region three. Yeah. I'm more excited. Um, so then other business care, this is just the meeting notes from our February meeting. Okay, so we're just looking for a motion to approve our meeting notes. We can do that this morning or uh, uh, earlier. <laughs> okay. I'm going to make the motion. This one is February 21st. Uh, second. Second. motion. Anybody opposed? All in favor? Anybody yeah. opposed? Thank you. Uh, so then looking at the next steps, uh, again, coming off the heels of our transportation discussion, last month um, we were able to synthesize those into strategies and then also from our various discussions uh, heard about um, potential strategies for healthy okay. communities. Those strategies being re uh, related to, say, recreation and parks or other sort of, again, amenities uh, that we've discussed. Um, same idea, we're going to have a drop-in session. Um, we do anticipate that happening in sometime in April. We do anticipate uh, that questionnaire launching sometime in April as well, running for about 30 days, but we don't have the specifics on those dates and locations for the drop-in session just yet. Um, so our next meeting is April 17th, where we do, where we will have those maps ready for you all to um, to mark up and make some decisions on. And then like we discussed, uh, potential additional meeting. I'd like to receive a few more responses. So I'll reach out to individuals to uh, get those since there are, there's two dates that may work. I think it's uh, the first April 20th date or the May 11th date. Um, but again, I do want to make sure that um, we do have everybody responses in before we make a decision. Um, and then, depending upon when that meeting is and how much you all get done during that meeting. Um, if we have that meeting, that May 15th meeting is, is now sort of tentative based on that uh, additional meeting and how much is completed. Um, so those are our next steps. Again, we've got our speaker information and then we always encourage folks to visit our hub site is our website for region one, where we
where we have a bunch of information, and we also have a link where you can sign up to receive updates, uh, such as receiving the agenda, as well as for each meeting, as well as then other uh, information regarding our drop-in sessions, our questionnaires, other items where the public can provide some feedback to us. So, okay, so that's all we have. Um, yes, I can ask a question. What did we decide on the tour? We haven't come to a conclusion on that just yet. Hmm. We're almost done. Before it's over, yeah. <laughs> Um, we're looking for a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. 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 All in favor? Break up the vision. Anyone opposed? Yeah. I'll see you guys. <laughs> <laughs>